Now, before I assign you homework with this lecture, will you please sign the petition to keep our campus from going back to 1984? This is like George Orwell's uh, book, 1984. Hey, before we begin, uh, follow L Twitter. The last one got banned because I posted Viper the Rapper. Follow L Instagram. I post La Meme. Sub to La Patreon. I need money. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh Life is Strange reviews compiled into one video. And also, uh, Goodbye Volcano High because I just thought it counts. New content being worked on is just gonna take a little bit. Alright, that's it. Bye. I uh, love you. Now that we got that mushy shit out of the way, I feel like stage diving. You know what? Before I begin, I want to do something positive. This game means a lot to certain people. The fans of this game claim that it saved their lives even. And quite a few people associate this game with helping them through a rough spot. So I'm gonna begin this video by very disjointedly talking about the things I like about this game. First off, the soundtrack isn't too bad. It's not exactly full of bangers or anything, but for what it is, it's relaxing, ambient, and fits the tone. And it certainly has melodies to it. I don't like every track in the game, and once again, I wouldn't blast this in my car or anything. Thing. But the soundtrack on its own is pretty decent. Furthermore, I think the concept is really unorthodox, but in a really good way. This is the first game where you play as a high schooler. Except for that one. But it is the first supernatural high school game where you solve a conspiracy. Except that but one. But it is the first video game where you play as a teenage high school girl. With psychological horror scenes rooted in feminine fears and insecurities. With multiple endings. Except that okay, one. Okay, maybe it's not entirely original. But it is part of a niche genre. High school girl simulator. And for that, I can kind of respect it. Even if I'm not too big on the execution. I think this game also helped the industry a bit. Allowing games that I do enjoy, like Night in the Woods, to really shine a bit. Since people will inevitably be looking for similar experiences to Life is Strange. And for that, I can respect Life is Strange in those regards. Now, going forward, I'm not going to be nearly as nice to this game. And just remember, you're not obligated to watch this video. There are plenty of other videos on this game criticizing and praising it. And once again, if this game influenced you positively, I can't really hate on that. My point is, no matter what your opinion is, do be rational. In the end, just remember, this is a fake video game, and someone not exactly loving it isn't a reason to hate them. Hate me, but do it honestly. And with that out of the way, this is my review of Life is Strange. Life is Strange fucking sucks. This game is an overrated disaster. It's fucking horrid. If it wasn't obvious already, I really don't like this game. When the game isn't gaslighting you into liking these awful, horrible, terrible characters, it's bombarding you with the worst dialogue known to man. Now, why don't you go fuck yourself in? I wouldn't even really call this a game. I think endurance test is more appropriate. Now, I know all this is one massive hot take, and I'm gonna have to elaborate one way or the other. So this is my review of Life is Strange, a game that I really, really do not like. Also, quick side note, I've really only died into the first game. I've only played a little bit of Before the Storm, but I never finished it and kind of forgot about it. The rest of the franchise seems pretty self-contained, so I doubt it would really change anything. But just in case it isn't, uh, I'm just gonna leave this here. I'm also playing and reviewing the original game. There's a remastered version that apparently is worse. At least so I've heard. Personally, I don't feel like giving $40 to an NFT factory. But just to tell you that it probably sucks. Anyways, this is my review of Life is Strange, you hella shaka bra. Hard one, these characters fucking suck. In Life is Strange, you play as Maxine Caldwell, a senior student at Blackwell Academy, a private boarding school where she's learning photography. However, she wakes up with mysterious time powers. Where does she get these time powers? Never explain. And due to the these powers, she has visions of a giant tornado for some reason. Sometimes the powers will conveniently go away for some reason. Max can also travel through time by staring at photos really intensely. How she is very conveniently able to go back in time with some photos and not other ones is beyond me, but who cares? All the while, Max is uncovering a giant conspiracy with twists and turns so out of left field and fucking stupid that you will be shocked once you realize this game has an overwhelmingly positive reception on Steam. All the while, you will meet a 
wide variety of characters. Around 24, in fact. And you'll be in awe once you remember only nine of them. And only enjoy the company of two of them. A good majority of these characters are absolutely abhorrent people. But it's not just that they're unlikable. Some characters are awful, horrible, terrible, evil people. But the game kind of gaslights you into liking them. Some characters are so cartoonishly evil that I half expect Spider-Man to start fighting them. Or some characters are just obnoxious. And I kind of want them dead by proxy anyways. And the characters I don't hate are usually just kind of bland and are relegated as forgettable side characters. Thankfully for the main character, Max, though, she isn't a side character. In my opinion, Maxine Caldwell is really boring. She's a shy dork and that's about it. With most of her personality being stating mundane bullshit. That is a tasty plasma. Fortnite. Battle Royale. Spouting off internalized exposition. I was in the bathroom. He shot that poor girl. This guy... He tripped and fell in the back of McDonald's. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Instagram for- And every once in a while making a really cringy pop culture reference. Must protect my precious so Max never has to chase it down again. Maybe I could sneak in and watch Final Fantasy Spirits Within. But to give the game some credit, I do think this could be an intentional choice. Making Max more bland could allow the player to insert themselves, allowing for more intimacy with the actual game's narrative, since this is a choice-driven game after all. Of course, all that choice-driven stuff is complete bullshit, but we'll get to that later. Still, I can't help but wish that Max were a bit more charismatic. I'm not asking for Nathan Drake or anything, just a little bit more spunk and personality. Night in the Woods was able to do this, so was The Wolf Among Us. I kinda wish Life is Strange did the same. It certainly would wouldn't have heard it. You have other characters like Warren, who I'm sure means well. But when you start sending me goddamn 2012 cat memes and start saying interwebs unironically, it'll be so karmic to see your ass clown face all over the interwebs. I can't help but kinda hate you. Nothing personal. He's also extremely creepy, hitting on Max every other interaction they have together in this very incelish way. So you're sensitive. Ouch, that sounds awful the way you say it. How so? Sensitive usually means won't be having sex with you. How the hell Max puts up with him is beyond me. And why people would want the romantic option with him is also beyond me. This works? You get a free hug. Fuck no, baby! This guy is so much of a red flag, he's played by Ryan Gosling. You like to hurt people, huh? Like Max? Like Kate? Like me! Next you have Mr. Jefferson, a famous photographer who's also Max's teacher. And the entire reason she's going to Blackwell in the first place. He's okay, I guess. Next, you have these goddamn cartoon bad guys. First, you have Victoria Chase, who is pretty much a mean girl's knockoff character. Her personality traits are being better than everyone else, and uh, literally nothing else. Now you're totally stuck in the retro zone. Sad face. Oh my god, Becky, you hear the new Drake album? It's the most one-dimensional generic female bully you could ever write. This game came out in 2015, and yet this character feels like she came out in 2007. No. Why don't you go fuck your selfie? The next cartoon bad guy is Nathan Prescott, a character who lives in a very wealthy family and whose family pumps a large amount of money into the school. He's also mentally unhinged, but not like in a well-written way, but more so in a hilariously over-the-top kind of way. You know who the fuck I am or who you're messing around The dude is a goddamn Don't Batman think. villain. I can't tell if he's about to shoot up the school or poison Gotham's water supply. However, he's also very pick and choosy with what he actually does. He's fully okay with choking a woman in a parking lot, like his name is Ezra Miller. But in a diner with one police officer, he's just gonna sit there and talk to you. By the way, thanks for getting me fucking expelled, you twee bitch. You're lucky this is a public place. Overall, this character is cartoonishly out of touch. Get used to that, by the way. It feels more like what the writers think a mentally ill person is like. Yet another one-dimensional character in this pile of shit game. There's also David Madsen, the stepdad of Max's best friend Chloe, who is the third cartoon bad guy in a row. He's a tough-as-nails war vet and the security guard at Blackwell. It's implied he watches the quarter. This is what happens at these PC bullshit colleges. Once I establish my theocracy, I will throw you in my dungeon and let you rot for a turn and probably domestically abuses Ooh. Chloe. The thing is, and this is really weird to say, but David might be one of the best characters in this game. Despite all of his problems, he does actually have a redemption arc. And just like you throughout the game, there is a conspiracy he's trying to uncover. His methods may be extremely questionable, but in the end, he, just like you, is trying to protect people. It will take more than Ms. Grant and her petition 
to find missing students. The problem is he has a really bad way of going about it, and his temper gets in the way of himself. In other words, unlike the other characters in this game, and despite how poorly written he actually is, he's one of the very few characters with actual nuanced depth to him. The problem is the writing of this character is still really on the nose, making it a bit too obvious what you're supposed to think about this character. Isn't that your responsibility as head of security? I don't want to fight with you anymore. Next character is Kate Marsh, who is emotional manipulation the character. I'll get to her problems a little bit later, but as of right now, I'll just say this. I don't actually like Kate Marsh's character because she's a good character. I liked her character because the game gaslighted me into liking her by making her kill herself. Otherwise, her character is I'm depressed and maybe Christian, which the game never explores religion anyway. So if you take Christianity out of her character, you'd have the exact same character anyways, which is in my opinion, a massive missed opportunity. I could have actually added to her character. If Kate were more fleshed out, the themes of suicide and depression could have been a lot more stronger. But apparently character traits don't actually exist according to this game. Like, all these characters flounder in comparison to Part 2, oh, Chloe okay, Price. Right. Chloe Price is one of the worst fictional characters ever written. I fucking loathe her. This fucking petty bitch. And it's not just that she's flawed or anything. You can have a flawed character and still have them be a good character. The thing is, Chloe does a whole bunch of horrible bullshit to you in the game. But the game never follows up on it. Remember Kate Marsh, the character who was suicidal and had depression? Yeah, if you choose to call her on your cell phone, Chloe Price gets really mad at you. Thanks, Max. If you'd rather chill with Kate- We do not- Now that you want to hang with Chloe anyways, she will abuse and play around with Max's time powers, using her supposed best friend as a tool, well after it's shown to be hurting her after overusage. God, this power really messes with my head. Oh, boo-hoo, Max is afraid. I know you can handle this. I, I accuse I, I, you of capping. She constantly rails on Max for leaving her when she was 13. Why does everybody in my life let me down? My dad gets killed, you bail on me for years. <laughs> and barely shows any compassion for anyone outside of herself. Yes, Kate Marsh killed herself. She's dead. Such sad, okay? That doesn't make me feel better about my fucked up life, get it? She's a massive hypocrite and believes the world constantly revolves around her. I thought you believed in gun control. Yes, I believe I should control the gun. It's the men who need to be checked. <laughs> Jesus, I shot myself! Ah, I shot myself! Carpadu! You fucking killed my dog! Oh my god! I just shot a man and his dog. And once again, the game never follows up on this. The game acts like Chloe is all badass and cool and shit, but also deeply broken. But she never actually improves herself throughout the story. She's never given any real consequences. And just when you think she is, and might start actually going through shit that changes her as a person, nope, just reverts to the same fucking garbage character. Either that, or the game gets so convoluted that it forgets what proper character arcs are. Oh, and another thing. You're not really allowed to dislike like Chloe in this game. Oh, you can try. You can certainly try. But the game is set up in such a way where you can't really truly talk back to Chloe, but everything gets haphazardly resolved anyway, so who cares? Oh, and here's something even funnier. So the reason Chloe is a fucking bitch is because her dad died years ago in a fatal, horrible car crash. And she's mad at him for this, I guess? So who do you most want to blame? My fucking dad, of course. Hello? Yeah, I blame my dead dad for driving and getting into an accident. Nobody else was involved in it or anything. He chose to go out that door and leave me forever. Chloe, your dad didn't choose to leave you. It was just a terrible accident. I wish that made me feel better. But ever since he died, my life has been dipped in shit. <laughs> But whatever, okay. So I said earlier that Max can travel through time through photos, right? So long story short, Max creates an alternate timeline where Chloe's dad lives, and this causes Chloe to eventually get in a car crash and become a quadriplegic. This man was the source of it all. Yeah, I wasn't joking earlier. The game is a gaslighting you into liking her. The real funny part, though, is that unironically, she's actually a better character. She's a lot nicer to you. Doesn't blame everyone else for her fucking problems. And even if the dialogue is fucking garbage. It is hella cold out here. Hella? 
I hate that word, no offense. <laughs> I kind of wanted to spend more time with her. And yet, that's not what the game wanted at all. The game wants you to go, oh, she's no longer on two legs anymore. Please give me the old fucking whore-ass bitch-ass Chloe again. Honestly, if it meant having a better character in her place, I would go up to this blue-haired cunt, slam her on the ground, and break her spine myself. For all these reasons, Chloe really doesn't work at all. In complete contrast, look at my man Gary from Bully. In that game, him being an unlikable douchebag isn't shied away at all. In fact, he's the main antagonist. Like Max and Chloe, Jimmy is essentially Gary's tool. But not only is that game not fucking lying to you, but Gary gaslighting you actually makes sense in the game. Bully is much more effective because Gary actually does try and harm you throughout the game. And has resolution when you kick his fucking ass. Finally standing up to him and not taking his bullshit anymore. Nothing like this ever happens in Life is Strange. Instead, Max just takes Chloe's bullshit over and over again until everything kind of resolves itself. Which is not good. <laughs> It also helps that Gary is a way more entertaining character. His condescendence is just way more fun, and he's genuinely way more charismatic, which is the entire point. I can genuinely see why people follow him. He's so entertaining. Why'd you do it, Gary? I thought we were friends. <laughs> friends? You and me. I've taken dumps that had more brains than you, friend. He's like what Chloe, Victoria, and Nathan all wish they could be. And in fact, I think he would actually patronize these kind of characters. Why does everybody in my life let me down? My dad gets killed, you bail on me for years, my mother gloms on a step fucker. Yeah, I've been expelled from anywhere halfway decent because I'm really bad. Give up the tough guy act, pal. Gotta blame somebody, otherwise it's all my fault. Fuck that. <laughs> Look at you. Leave me alone, Gary. I'm really self-important now that I finally hit puberty. Part 3. The story is really dumb. The thing is, if all of these characters were at least written well, then maybe I could look past a lot of this shit. But I just- I just can't. The dialogue in this game is fucking garbage. These characters don't actually talk like human beings, but rather what 40-year-old aliens think teenagers talk like. This results in a lot of slang terms being thrown around willy-nilly, which comes off as desperately trying to be relatable. And yet this harms the game when characters don't actually know what the fuck they're talking about. I see why Chloe hangs here. She's a steampunk. A steampunk? <laughs> so twizzy. I love Tonkas. This is already turned, but here's the bell. You'll have normal 18-year-old girls refer to each other as ninjas in casual conversation, no less. Thanks, Mac. You're like the Blackwell ninja. Huh? This dialogue is fucking whack. Sometimes I'm just rephrasing what people say as, like, questions just so I can process the dumb mastery these people say. I'm the worst baby mom. I could get you satisfied. Speaking of dystopia, that drive-in is having a 70s Planet of the Apes marathon. Let's go ape! That's not even a, a reference to the movie. Warren is such a classic nerd. As opposed to a modern one. Oh, I guess he needed a neophyte assistant so he wouldn't be threatened. This is what nerds talk like. Um, stop me if I'm being too emo. Please, my diary is like emo ground zero. Shut the fuck up! I came to no slide, but I'd love to see somebody do a tree flip. Oh, sick. You're not a poser. Yeah, but the writers are. Holy shit! Jackpot! Cha-ching! Cha-ching? Now, let's talk business. Business? This dialogue is like a future lyrics. I would think you'd fit right in with the art school hipsters. Right. You look like the cover of hipstergirl.com. Put in an ass made of pee pee. It's not just the cringy internet term. The story itself is an absolute clusterfuck. First of all, how does Max get her time powers? I get they're going for a whole Groundhog's Day thing, where the incident isn't really explained, and the focus is on the characters, right? But Groundhog's Day isn't fucking convoluted. In that movie, you get the scenario. A man's day repeats over and over again. It's one sentence, and it's simple. Life is strange, on the other hand. Max has time powers, right? So she can reverse time. Okay, good. Pretty good. But she can also travel back in time by accident by looking at photos and then change the course of history but this only happens sometimes but also she can have visions of a giant tornado too sometimes these powers just go away for no reason but also she has evangelion styled mental breakdown oh and also she can travel back in time on purpose she just needed to learn how to do it it's a fucking mess i really don't think it would have hurt the story to have a simple explanation on where exactly max got her time powers the movie chronicle did this really well in my opinion the characters go to this 
underground cave thingy, see this weird alien thing, and boom, they have their powers. And that's it. That's all the movie needed. This allows for a simple explanation on where their powers came from, but still letting the movie be character driven. Life is Strange doesn't have this shit. It instead lets the story be so over convoluted without actually giving a reason as to why it's over convoluted. It wants this crazy Evangelion type story with all this world ending time travel shit, but it ends up being really disjointed. Also, there are plenty of times where Max can just rewind time to get out of a problem she's in, but because we need some stakes in a certain scene, she just doesn't. There's a scene where Chloe's boot is trapped in a railway, but Max doesn't rewind time to when she wasn't in the railway. There's a scene where Max is investigating Nathan's dorm room, but Chloe and Max encounter him on the way out, and instead of rewinding time and hiding with Chloe until he passes by, Max just stares at him like a goddamn deer in the headlights so that Warren can beat him up. And the only rewinding you can actually do in this scene is rewinding to the choice on whether you want Warren to beat up Nathan or stop him mid-fight. This action will have consequences, my ass! You could have prevented this! Honestly, the game would have been way better without time powers. Oh yeah, sometimes it's kinda cool getting new information out of people and rewinding time to use that against them is pretty creative. But these moments are so few and far between and don't actually really matter throughout the story. Oh wait, no, I'm wrong. Sometimes the game will throw stealth sequences into the game just to go, hey, we have time powers and you're using them. What the time travel powers actually are for is making you second guess the choices you make. Every time you make any major choice in life is strange, Max will go, wowzers, that was a crazy choice I just made. But I'm not sure I should have made that choice. Maybe I should rewind time and choose the other option. Man, that did not go well for me. If I want to keep my Blackwell scholarship, I shouldn't lie for anybody. Even Chloe. Every goddamn time! The game is gaslighting you, motherfucker! Jesus, I almost shot this guy. And now he'll be more dangerous to Chloe and me. Isn't your choices being extremely concrete and last minute kind of the appeal of these games? Making crucial hard decisions you can't go back on? Life is Strange just feels so cheap in comparison. It makes you almost unnaturally second guess every choice you make. It feels like time travel is more of a gimmick than a genuine good thing in this game. Time out, Max. You actually told Kate to go to the police and the principal after getting a scary text threat. Now the police will definitely drag you into this shit. Shut your ass up. It doesn't help that so much happens in this game as well. On top of all the crazy time power shit, you have a whole conspiracy theory plot involving rich families, serial killers, old abandoned friends, drug dealers, missing people who were friends with your friends, cyberbullying, suicidal people, domestic disputes. So much happens in this game that it crashes and burns by the end of it. Oh no! This game I think would have been way better if it didn't have any time powers and was more about a girl finding a conspiracy. That would have, in my opinion, led to a much more tighter story. One where the stakes actually feel like they kind of matter and the actual big stakes don't feel completely forced. You know what else would have improved the story? Not fucking up Kate Marsh. Yeah, we're getting into detail on this bitch finally. Now look, I know a lot of people are narratively gaslit into really loving this character. And this may be a major hot take, but here it goes. How Kate Marsh is handled is 13 reasons why levels of bad. So in the story, Kate Marsh is cyberbullied, right? This leads her to being really sad and depressed. And throughout the story, you can choose to help her. Okay, that's fine and all. Some of the choices, though, are really fucking contrived. Like, for example, there's a scene where David Madsen is harassing her. And you can choose to either take a picture of the situation or step in and defend Kate. But here's the thing. If I take a picture of the situation, I will literally have proof against David Madsen. But if I do take a picture, Kate gets really mad at me without Max trying to explain herself or anything. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for nothing, Max. I'm trying to help you, you dumb fucking bitch. But whatever. I'm able to explain myself a little bit later. Max, why didn't you do anything when David harassed me yesterday? I wanted proof David was in your face. Shit, Negro. That's all you had to say. In one of the very few scenes where Max and Kate talk to each other. Before, you know, the big one. In fact, now that I think about it, you kind of have to go out of your way to talk to her. And there is a way to be the best possible friend to her. Including wiping off video links that other students are bullying her for. Here's the problem. Uh, none of this fucking matters. Because no matter how close you get with her, there's going to be this big dramatic scene where she tries killing herself. And the only way to stop her from killing herself is to, and I'm not joking here, play a stupid ass trivia game. And if you lose the suicide, Side mini game, she kills herself. Am I the only one who thinks this is kind of disingenuous? Wait, Kate. Think about your brothers. They need their sister. You don't know me at all, Max. I told you I only have six. 
sister. What the fuck? Life is strange. Oh, what's this? You formed a friendship with a suicidal girl? Helping her realize that life is worth living? Yeah, no, fuck that. Why the fuck the writers thought it would be a good idea to dangle this extremely serious topic over you with the goddamn Spider-Man Web of Shadows trivia game is beyond me? It also unintentionally makes her look more petty. Like, sorry I don't know every facet of your fucking life. My goddamn mistake. And I don't think it would have been hard to fix this problem either. If Kate Marsh's fate was dependent on how close you were as a friend throughout the game, that could have been way stronger and way more respectful. In fact, it would have been way better if the entire game were about Max and Kate. Instead of this dog shit toxic friendship we have going on, the game could have been a heartwarming exploration of befriending sad people. The game could have been about finding yourself in the darkest of situations. And the theme of the importance of friendship would have been way, way, way stronger. A lot of these emotional moments would have been a lot stronger if instead of Chloe, we, we had Kate instead. Locking this all off to an optional side story is super disingenuous. And I would even say it's straight up suicide bait. All these problems make for a really consistently unenjoyable experience. So much happens in this game that it topples over on itself. The game has these ultra dark themes, but the writing isn't good enough to compensate for it. But all this is really ruined when we get to the part four, uh, the ending sucks dick. Life is Strange Chapter 5 is a fucking disaster. Up until this point, anything shitty could have easily been intentional. Maybe the game was leading up to something. No. What the game was really leading up to was a cheap plot twist, ripping off Silent Hill 3, Batman Arkham Asylum, and Evangelion. So you're telling me Christ died for my sins? And an ending so shitty and bad that it quite literally ruins the entirety of the game. I'm not even exaggerating. Life is Strange genuinely has one of the worst endings of all time. But let's back up a minute first. So I mentioned Mr. Jefferson, right? So throughout the game, he's a pretty regular character. He's just an art teacher, I guess. Seems pretty chill. But then, out of complete left field, he becomes the serial killer plot twist. Who ends up shooting Funny. Chloe in the head, so maybe he's the good guy the whole time. But here's the thing. Instead of translating the old character into a more menacing character, they instead essentially decided to write a completely different character. They just went, oh, you know the old Mr. Jefferson? Let's make him completely out of character. In fact, he's so out of character, his fucking accent changes. But life won't wait for you to play catch up. You're young, the world is yours, blah, blah. Blah, blah, right? If only Nathan could see this setup. He tried so hard. But you can't just throw a few subjects around and expect a cohesive style or theme. I'm over here stroking my dick. I got lotion on my dick right now. I'm just stroking my shit. It's like the voice actor is doing a really bad G-Man impression. You really should have focused on schoolwork, not private detecting with your little friend. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. All this results in me not really being able to take this seriously at all. I've already associated Mr. Jefferson with a completely different character and to make him into what is to the audience completely out of character in this completely jarring way just gives me whiplash. And before you say, oh, dumb Z, it's not that bad. No, uh, it's still god awful. I knew you were special the second I saw your first selfie. Yes. I still hate that word. Oh my god, is this game pranking me? Well then after some looking through photo ing, Max goes back to the beginning of the game and texts Chloe's stepdad saying that Mark Jefferson is guilty, which leads to his arrest and Max being a famous photographer. Life is weird. Shut your ass up. <laughs> But I guess the events of Life is Strange also happened anyway, because Chloe, the R timeline Chloe, tells Max that her vision is true, and the tornado is hitting Max's home of Arcadia Bay. Max, holy shit, man, your vision, it's, it's true. You, you saw the tornado, it's coming. How convenient. Max then goes back in time again and restores the other timeline to save Chloe, but now she's back in Mr. Jefferson's place again. But thankfully, David Madsen saves her. How convenient. Which means the text in the other timeline was canonical. So he waited until this very convenient time to save you? And if not, then how does he know about Mr. Jefferson? Yeah, he suspected him, but not to the extent that he was a fucking serial killer. But at the very least, you get an optional conversation with David. And this conversation is one of the best in the game. It does bring his whole character arc to a close. I'm not gonna make any excuses for my behavior. I tried to be a good soldier, but I wasn't so great. I tried to be a good father, too. But... You saw how that went. And even after everything he's done to Chloe, and even though he's a really flawed person, this scene does show that he genuinely cared about her and the safety of the students at Blackwell. And in the end, it really does humanize him. It's hard to come home after war. Most people don't know or care what it's like, except Joyce. 
She gave me hope. A new life. And if you tell him Chloe's dead, it's genuinely pretty heartbreaking. For David, of course. Uh, fuck Chloe Price. David. Uh, Chloe is... is... dead. This isn't happening. I saw a... Jefferson Killer in the junkyard. Last night. Last night? When I was so close to finding out the truth? I promised Joyce that I would protect her and Chloe. That's why David Madsen, a character you're not supposed to like, is my favorite character in the game. He has actual depth to him. Just a shame this conversation is entirely optional. So long story short, a bunch of shit happens. The town's going to shit. You can make out with Warren in this scene. Max starts breaking time again. And the game goes all Neon Genesis Evangelion on you. Or at least it tries to. Because when Evangelion went all mental breakdown on you, I was actually creeped out by it. And life is strange, how. However, I'm usually holding back my laughter. Ooh, it's Kate Marsh, the mentally unstable girl who killed herself. Oh, what's this? She's yelling at you, then going into the great beyond. I've never seen this before. Oh, what's this? Max is opening a door and ah, she's in the same hallway. Oh, by golly, I've never seen this before. Oh, what's this? You play as Veronica, the bad guy for a small portion. Wow, I've never seen that Funny. before. You then have to sneak past every other character in the game as they insult and demean you in the goofiest ways possible. The only place I can be my selfie is in the dark room. Maxine Caulfield has died under tragic circumstances that I promise to investigate after I get my drink on. Huh? Hey, baby. Who wants to go in? Uh, this is meant to be scary, right? What's up with you and that blue-haired loser? You need an alpha male, baby. Max, Rachel not only gave great headshots, she gave great <laughs> I think in a bunch of scenes of Chloe dismissing Max as a friend. Max is a fucking child. I'm so over her hipster bullshit. Wow, man, this is really scary. Look at Max spying on us. Take a fucking picture, bitch. Remember in Metal Gear Solid 2 when they completely deconstructed your entire belief system? In that game, the big scary bad guys were actually kind of onto something, which is why that game will still terrify me to this day. I'll decide for myself what to believe and what to pass on. But is that even your own idea? Or something Snake told you? The same thing in Spec Ops The Line? That game will deconstruct your entire moral compass. Which is the entire point. I didn't mean to hurt anybody. No one ever does, Warner. In Life is Strange, characters just kind of call you a bitch for this whole nightmare sequence. I wish you would have never come back to Arcadia Bay. You're the real storm. Oh, by the way, so earlier in the game, you can make out with Chloe and be a lesbian. You know, Drake moment, right? So fucking get this. To make things even goofier, there's not one, but two times where Chloe makes out with someone else. When I streamed this game a while back, I literally burst out laughing at this part. <laughs> no way! <laughs> It's the goofiest fucking shit. If people like this game? Oh, we'll do. <laughs> Max then meets herself and then she yells at herself and she's like, you're a bad person. But well, then Chloe comes in and is all like, no, you're not a bad person. Then the game emotionally manipulates you again by showing you all the good times you two had together, even though she fucked you over for most of them. So at this point, the game is just straight up emotionally abusing you. People like this game and we finally get one last interaction with Chloe. Now, reminder, this game is very much choice driven. So guess how many endings there are? Two. There are two endings in this choice-driven game, all dictated by one choice. So this whole warning screen about your choices mattering in the whole game, yeah, bullshit. You may have noticed I skipped over a lot of stuff, this is why, because it doesn't matter at all. Hell, not even the stuff I did mention really matters anyway. But before I get ahead of myself, this is what actually happens. So you have a choice of either sacrificing Chloe Price and letting her get shot by Nathan, thus saving Arcadia Bay from the contrived disaster tornado, or letting everyone die in Arcadia Bay, and it's only you and Chloe who are alive. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd rather kill myself than live the rest of my life with this fucking whore. So really, there's only one correct ending. I know I've been selfish, but for once, I think I should accept my fate. Okay, bye. Get that gun away from me, psycho! 
Oh, by the way, uh, if you sacrifice Chloe, Kate Marsh fucking lives. So yeah, your choices really don't matter in this game. You know, why would I care about her jumping off a goddamn rooftop when I could just make it all better by throwing a blue-haired bitch into a tornado? And that's why I'm saying this ending ruins the whole game. Because it does ruin the whole game. All of your choices and actions are completely nullified. They mean nothing now. For a game that's already insanely poorly written, this is just the nuclear bomb on top of the fucking radiation Sunday. This entire chapter is already really garbage, with terrible plot twists and god-awful dialogue, and the worst attempts at a horror I've ever goddamn seen, only to end off by just going, hey, the entire rest of the game was a waste of fucking time. This game is garbage, people like this shit? Part 5, Conclusion. Look, if you enjoy Life is Strange, all the power to you. And by all means, feel free to disagree with me. But I just can't enjoy this game whatsoever. The writing is awful. The characters are awful. The fact your choices don't actually matter is awful. The suicide bait is awful. Chloe Price is awful. And in my opinion, this game is awful and overrated. If you want a better alternative, I recommend Night in the Woods. The writing in that game is just so much better, so much more human. Despite being cartoon animals, the characters in Night in the Woods are so horrifyingly realistic. I can pinpoint real life people these characters remind me of that I've met. That's a good thing, by the way. The themes of mental illness are much more realistic in that game, and the fears of growing up are genuinely really profound. This is what Life is Strange wishes it could be. Maybe check it out one day. It's on pretty much every platform imaginable. Don't let the furry shit scare you because this game is the fucking goat. No cap. So in conclusion, I don't like Life is Strange. Should have been more like Call of Duty with guns and blood. And if you like it, you should feel bad. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Damn, By toolbox, did David mean this, or did he mean himself? Shut your ass up. <laughs> Well, here we are. Life is strange before the storm. Now, it's no secret. I think the first game sucks. However, apparently, I'm Joker Cuckoo Crazy because the game made loads of money. You got hella cash. And saved Don't Nod from the near bankruptcy of their last title, Remember Me, which nobody remembers, and won Games for Impact at the Jeff Keighley Adventures Awards. Mr. Hideo Kojima. Did you like it? Yeah, my money. And since Life is Strange sold really well, <laughs> scored really well, and is probably really cheap to make, that means it's franchise time, boys. Meanwhile, Legacy of Cain got shafted for 20 years. Given the choice, whether to rule a corrupt and failing empire, or to challenge the fates for another throw, a better throw against one's destiny, what was a king to do? But rest assured, the Life is Strange franchise is still going strong. Most ironic of all was the last gift that Raziel had given me. The first bitter taste of that terrible illusion. Hope. So this game wasn't actually developed by Don't Nod, but rather a new studio called Deck Nine, who previously made such classics like Pain for the PS3. We wouldn't see Don't Nod return to the franchise until Life is Strange 2, before abandoning it again. So this game is all new blood. But furthermore, this game is indeed a prequel, starring my favorite character, Chloe Price, and her relationship with Rachel Amber, the missing girl from the first game. So already, that first game's mystery is immediately at risk of being ruined, or at the very least, just boringly rehashed. Wow, what a great idea for a prequel. I too also think the best Silent Hill was the shitty one. Hey. You a doctor for a fucking ugly bitch. But regardless, Deck 9 has a lot to work with. I mean, plumbing is a really hard job. You have to deal with a lot of shit. Apparently not even Life is Strange fans are too big on this game, saying that it's not as good as the first one. Dear God, I'm horrified. So let's just uh, see how it is. Also a few things to note first. First of all, the first time I beat this game was when I was recording footage for this video. So in the case of the first game, I had one to seven years to fully form my opinion. And before the Storm's case, I had about one month. So if my opinions are unrefined as hell, that's why. But secondly, I'm playing the PC version on Steam Deck. I really wanted to try it out. So once again, no shitty remastered version. Also, I will not be playing the Life is Strange Before the Storm. Yeah. 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 
edition, which includes an extra episode titled Farewell. Now, I don't know about you, but I really don't want to spend 10 extra dollars on a game I probably won't like just to get a little bit of paywalled story content. It's gonna cost a lot of bucks. Yeah. Maybe I'll make a Life is Strange bonus video one day, but as of right now, color me uninterested. If there's anything important in this chapter, I really don't care to know what it is. But enough digressing. This is Life is Strange before the shit storm. Staying at your dress cause it's see for your uncle production Coming out of shit that you done been through yeah. Say that you a lesbian, girl, me too Hey, girls want girls where I'm from Hey, girls, hey, girls what want the girls is Hello, I'm your Solid Bar Part one is the game an improvement. No, it's not. Well, let's start off with what's better about the game. One, the music is good, and that's literally it. Everything else in this game is either on par with the first and doesn't improve the game substantially, or genuinely terrible and somehow worse than the first game. I would say that as an overall package, it's on par with the first game's quality, which isn't a good thing. Like the first game, the dialogue is absolutely terrible, with the writers not really knowing how humans communicate. As a result, you get this mess of pop culture and slang that feels panderingly is that a word panderingly unrealistic did you just laugh i did chloe just owned you this dialogue is darman levels of bad how did this franchise win awards again got my dvd one blade runner director's cut coming right up uh, what are you playing dragon sick <laughs> I've never heard of it. There's genuinely not a whole lot to say either. If you watched my first Life is Strange video, I have the same complaints here. Only this time, you're playing as the shitty person I hate. I'm just glad someone here appreciates the classics. You even asked for the director's cut, which took out the shitty voiceover and replaced it with a sweet dream sequence. What are you talking about? So really, the dialogue has not improved at all. Not that I exactly expected it to, but garbage writing is still garbage writing. I didn't realize you and Rachel were such BFFs. I would like to greet you a happy birthday and- To make matters worse, the writing feels more amateurish this time. They have a whole new team working on this, and as a result, it just feels way more flimsy. The dialogue is so wistfully Holy unrealistic fuck. and plays into stereotypes of what people think drug addicts and hipsters are like that when the game tries to be grounded it can't be taken seriously because two episodes earlier I was given a Kojima level exposition dump on fucking Blade Runner it feels like God's not dead level writing only instead of Christian propaganda now it's fuck words and Drake Aubrey Graham now in the first game I hated nearly everyone I encountered and when I didn't I was being gaslit into liking them now before the storm actually fixes this issue by having me forget everyone that I encountered pretty much all the new characters are so fucking bland. I genuinely did not care about them. And even the old characters are shells of their former selves. I'll get to them later. But to make a long story short, you're supposed to recognize them and that's the entire value of their characters in this game. Serving no full-on story function whatsoever. Aside from, oh look, I remember him. Even Rachel Amber, who we'll get to later, is nothing more than a manic pixie dream girl with some half-assed emotional problems. But trust me, we'll get there later. Also like the first game, your choices don't mean anything in this game. It really does feel like they rehashed the first game's biggest problem. There are entire sections of the game that pretend like you have to win them, but even if you intentionally fail them, the game just keeps on going. For example, there's one part in the game where you have to, out of nowhere, put on a stage performance for the Tempest. It's a funny moment, you see. So at the last minute, you have to memorize some lines and deliver the right ones on stage. And you are a Nazi whore. And I kid you not, you can fuck up this entire segment and yet it quite literally affects nothing. I'm not even joking. You can't lose this section. Even if you deliver all the lines wrong, the scene plays out nearly the exact ah. same, minus some minor dialogue changes. It's literally bitches be like, You're a born thespian, my dear. I'll be chasing you down next year. And the ending, absolutely transformative. I am humble. And then 10 minutes later, A stumbling start, perhaps, but then, absolutely transformative. I am humble. <laughs> oh, and also there are only two endings again. So once again, like the first game, your choices really do not matter. And yes, I know it's a prequel, but it's a prequel to a choice-driven game. And it's a prequel that itself pretends to be choice-driven, oh. which begs the question, why did you make this? Why does this game exist? Did you not see the immediate problems when making this game? That it might be way too obvious the game is going to end in a certain way? The game wants to have its cake and eat it too. It wants to be a choice-driven 
choice-driven game like the first, but you can't be choice-driven when we already know what happened! Why didn't you make a sequel and or prequel with a new cast of characters? Oh wait, you would do that anyway! So why did you even bother doing this one? Was Chloe Price's story really that important to tell? Because it for sure really doesn't feel that way. Overall, this game is not an improvement from the first. If you liked the first game, I can at least say it's more of the same. But by its very nature, it's so blatantly not as engaging. So no, Before the Storm is not an improvement. What it is, however, is a really bad prequel. Number two, it's a bad prequel. Making a prequel is really hard work. It's not enough to just explain what happened before the original story. You have to actively make that prequel a good story as well and have it be able to stand on its own. It's really hard to do that when the audience already knows the ending. But as long as you don't do it before the storm does, which is somehow below the bare minimum, you might be able to get away with it. As a prequel, Before the Storm is an absolute huh? failure. It's kind of impressive how they fucked it up this bad. First of all, all the old characters have been completely ruined, being reduced to Marvel Cinematic Universe reference space. And I didn't even like them in the first game. Their entire value is you knowing who they are already, but not their actual function in the story. There is literally a scene where Nathan Prescott comes in. He gets pushed around for a bit. He calls you a bitch, I guess. You think I need help? from you and just never shows up for the rest of the game it's like they want all the 12 year olds playing this to go uh, i recognize the press guy I clapped i clapped when i saw it victoria chase also shows up and tries to drug your drink like once in the game and does next to nothing else she's only here because you remember her with the exception of chloe price all the old characters are never properly explored which once again makes them glorified references which a fun fact doesn't make your story good you see that in the movies References give you no narrative advantage whatsoever. You also have Frank in this game, who in the original game is that drug dealer who has the dog that Chloe kills. And while he does get more screen time than other characters, he still functions as a glorified plot device and doesn't really do anything in the story. Oh, and David's also here. And holy shit, did they neuter David. I kid you not, David's arc legitimately makes zero sense. So in the original game, he was an abusive prick, right? But had a pretty cool redemption arc and was one of the few things I liked about the game. Seeing him be forced to confront his own actions, seeing Seeing all the nuances in his character, he was complicated, but also went through a really good arc. Once again, in the original game, he genuinely cared for Chloe, but had some pretty horrible flaws that were also enabled by Chloe. In this game, he makes one relatively sexist comment. Oh, why do you women always take forever to get ready? <laughs> and is otherwise relatively nice to you in the game. The fucking morons who wrote this looked at David's redemption arc and thought that meant he was a relatively nice guy. This makes Chloe, who we'll get to a little bit later, either look like a needless prick, which is for the most part the case, and door completely out of character. You can literally make peace with David and accept him as your stepdad in this game, only for all of that to be nullified once the first game begins. It's actually impressive how they were able to write themselves into a corner like this. I've had my share of grief. I know what you're going through. Be careful out there, Chloe. Is it grass? You been token up again in here? You smoke that gas station weed! And while we're on the topic, and because I have no idea where else to put this, David's voice actor is so fucking shitty. So in this game, they pretty much recasted almost everyone because of the video game's voice actor strike. Because of this, a lot of the new cast sound more like they're doing impressions of old characters, which already isn't very good. But for David, who the fuck look at this tough <laughs> army man character and went, yeah, let's get a Silent Hill voice actor to do this game. You know... You could actually be good at this if you lost the attitude. I was the one who saved her from the fire. Also in the original game, it's revealed that Rachel Amber cheated on Chloe with Frank. I can't believe she was banging Frank. Rachel straight up lied to my face. Yeah, my only car. This is never explored in Before the Storm. This is like making the Star Wars prequels, but the entire trilogy is fucking Attack of the Clones. Oh shit, that's me! There are also plot holes and plot inconsistencies. I already mentioned how David's arc is completely just fucked over. And I won't be really getting into them because frankly, I just don't care that much. But if you're interested in learning about them, you can go to the Life is Strange wiki, where there's an entire article on pretty much all the canon inconsistencies. What? A fucking shit show. Okay, so I'm editing the video now and I'm kind of sick, so I uh, sound like shit. But according to this uh, article and according to Don't Nod, uh, Chloe Price is left handed in the original game, but uh, Don't Nod 
forgot to tell uh, uh, deck nine or whatever. So, in before the storm, she's just right-handed for, for no fucking reason. What a disaster this is. What the fuck? Now, in contrast, Metal Gear Solid 3 is an amazing prequel. Without spoiling this amazing experience, Metal Gear Solid 3 isn't solely reliant on nostalgia bait, but rather actually expands on previous elements of the previous game. Case in point, Revolver Ocelot, who is a really important character in the previous two games, plays a really important role in Metal Gear Solid 3, which ties him into the rest of the series. Ah! MGS3 is also just a really good game on its own, with really cool, thought-provoking themes, and just in general, really enjoyable characters. Ah! Uh... Life is Strange Before the Storm, however, is way too reliant on it being a prequel, and yet never actually explores anything that would be worth exploring in a prequel. You're hella mysterious, Chloe Price. Uh, hella? <laughs> Who says that? It's like they hired a Wattpad fanfiction writer to write this. It's only made to appease fans of the previous game, but not actually do anything unique with that. And we haven't even gotten to the main part of the game yet. Part three, a Chloe and Rachel bad. Yes, and you a lesbian girl, me too. Oh, golly gee, it's I my favorite really characters. It's actually really impressive how they were able to fuck this up on three different levels. From Chloe herself to Rachel herself to the romance itself. Sweet. First off, Chloe Price. Now in the original game, I fucking hated this bitch. And in this game, she's not a whole lot better. Only this time, she's the main character. Meaning that overly snarky bitchiness is now translated into interpersonal dialogue. And it's just as obnoxious as you would think it would be. Fun fact. Shark babies eat their siblings in the womb. Maybe that's why I'm an only child. Shut your ass up. <laughs> And with the exception of the parts where the game gives you choices, the dialogue never changes. Not only is the writing obnoxiously angsty, but it's also repetitive. They want Chloe to be witty and sassy. A quirked up white girl on a Tuesday afternoon. This aggressive, edgy punk girl. But of course, by edgy and sassy, they really mean giving a middle finger to a fence in the beginning of the game. By witty, they mean let's give her a fucking rap battle mechanic. Yeah, I don't know where else to put this, but uh, there's a rap battle mechanic where you can backtalk people and get new information out of them. Of course, these rap battling bars result to middle school insults. Chloe, this can't be you. Apologize this insult. I'm the head of state. You're like a head of cabbage. Because while the writers want Chloe to be witty, the idea of witty the writers have in mind is epic rap battles of history. Look at my face. Do I look cute? You got the mama jeans. So already you have a pretty bad main character. But at the very least, it serves its function of being a decent romance. Is what I would say if the game served its function of being a decent romance. Now here's the thing. Writing a good romance is incredibly hard. You need to have two very well-developed characters and have engaging chemistry between them. But we already established that one of those characters is Chloe Price. So already one of these characters is completely unengaging. But now we have Rachel Amber and the rest of the romance. Now a lot of people really hate hate Rachel Amber, including fans of Life is Strange. It's very similar to how I hated Chloe Price in the first game. However, unlike Chloe, who is a fucking bitch and I hope dies, Rachel is just the kind of bland, who is affected by mispotential, if we're gonna use that word, and probably some of the worst pacing I've ever seen in a while. But first of all, once again, Rachel Amber is pretty much a manic pixie dream girl. At least she gets really close to it. She's this almost angelic figure to Chloe. The story treats her as this very charming figure you're supposed to like, even though she cheats on Chloe after the game ends, which isn't actually explored, which sucks because that could have actually been cool to explore. It could have explored Chloe changing through Rachel and not for the better, but what actually happens is she starts off as a bitch and ends up as a bitch, but this time with blue in her hair. In terms of personal character arcs, they just kind of meander around for a bit. While meanwhile, you have a bunch of Metal Gear Solid plot twists. Glad to know that's where the story's priorities are. The worst part about Rachel, though, is that she's frankly just fucking boring. She doesn't play off of Chloe Price at all and has next to no chemistry with her. In fact, the most chemistry these two have together is this wistful exposition that has no bite or anything to it. I was just thinking, maybe I was wrong before. Who cares if the stars are dead? Fuck the stars. I'm already a demon. This game understands romantic chemistry as well as a Wattpad fanfiction does. What this game also doesn't understand is proper pacing. So the original game was five episodes long, right? With each episode lying around the hour and a half to two and a half hour mark, allowing for a decently sized eight hour game. In other words, one of the better parts of the game was the pacing, which at best is fine, I guess. But before the storm, at least the core game is three episodes long. Meaning they have to cram a lot more into one episode 
episode. Meaning that we first meet Rachel in a love at first sight kind of way. Have one full conversation with her. Bitch took my yoo -hoo. And then she sees her dad cheating on her, supposedly. Leading to a third act breakup between Chloe and Rachel. In the first episode, it's extremely jarring. The pacing is way too fast. The scenes with Chloe and Rachel feel like they last like five seconds and are so over-reliant on tropes and plot beats simply because they didn't have time to actually flesh it out. It's very similar to how the first game has so much going on, but none of it really connects properly. But in the first game, it was a too many cooks in one kitchen kind of situation. But in Before the Storm, you do indeed have enough for a five episode game, but the game is told over three episodes. I'm pretty much complaining about everything except for the romance because that's how memorable the romance actually is. The romance itself is just not well written at all and involves two characters I couldn't give a single shit about. What could have been a romance about manipulation, which could have been a pretty cool deconstruction of Rachel as a character, devolves into a bunch of dumb plot twists that are not only contrived but also actively take away from what should have been the main focus. This shit is fucking ass! Part 4, other dumb shit. I don't know when to get this video done. Like I said earlier, the game is only three episodes Long, leading to a really rushed pacing. As a result, you're more so told through exposition what to feel, rather than being subtly shown. A case in point, these really dumb dream sequences, where Chloe's dad comes out and starts explaining inner character motivations. See? You're so drawn to it. You don't even realize the danger. Shut your bitch ass up! It's so blatant what you're supposed to feel during these scenes. It's quite literally explained to you. It's like if in Silent Hill 2, if just randomly in the game, Mary came out and went, James, you're just guilty and horny. Don't feel bad. And then starts reading Silent Hill 2's Wikipedia article. What is it with these games and just being shit at subtlety? You would think that for an M-rated series, it would be a little bit more, you know, mature. What else is there? Uh, there's a really dumb plot twist where you get that scene where Rachel sees her dad cheating on her mom or something, but it turns out that's actually Rachel's real mom, and her real mom is a heroin addict. This doesn't impact the greater Life is Strange universe at all, of course. It's just so we can have some drama in this dumbass plot, which you could have done anyways with the Rachel cheating on Chloe plot. I don't know. These narrative choices are really stupid. There's this one character who has the hots for Chloe Price. I forgot he existed, so that's how good his character is. You get the origins of Hela in this game. Ah, oh, finally! My experience with the original game is finally in hand. Was this game like rushed or something? This is all shockingly sloppy, even by Life is Strange standards. Like, what is the point to this? In fact, on that note, Conclusion, what is the point to this? This game has no reason to exist. It doesn't expand on anything. Most of this game is just referencing the first game. There's even a fucking post credit scene, which is one big Mr. Jefferson tease. This is a fucking Marvel movie. Wow, I'm glad the guy who drugs, kidnaps, and murders women is now suddenly treated like he's Mr. Fucking Fantastic. What's up, bitches? This chair wouldn't he? It's fucking dumb! How do people like this? Will Mr. Jefferson be fighting Thanos in the MCU? Look, enjoy what you want, okay? But here's the thing. This is a dumb game made for dumb people. What am I supposed to analyze here? The fucking oh, reference bait cameos? The contrived as shit plot twist? The still awful dialogue? And these games are fucking garbage. And before the storm is borderline pointless. It honest to God doesn't enhance anything about the original game. The best thing I can say about it is, if you like the original, this is more of the same, I guess. Only this time, way more sloppy. This game is shit. I'm going back to Fortnite. But please play Night in the Woods instead. Wow. So you're like all political. Everything is political, Sean. Legalize nuclear bombs. <laughs> well, well, well. Here we are, uh, again. So after the overrated disaster that was Life is Strange 1, and the Deck 9 developed disaster prequel that was Before the Storm, don't nod the original developers came back for Life is Strange 2. Now, I had a lot of people telling me that Life is Strange 2 is the best in the series, and a massive step up from the rest of the games. However, I've also heard, um, divisive things about it, and because it's a Life is Strange game, I kinda went in with really low expectations. So I finished episode 1, Realized that I forgot to play Captain Spirit, finished that real quick, thought it fucking sucked, finished the rest of Life is Strange 2, watched a YouTube video on all the shit I missed, and man, I have some complex feelings, but we'll get there later. But despite my low expectations, I was still marginally curious. This game has a new cast of characters, and doesn't follow Max and Chloe, which in my eyes is a very good thing. But would these new characters be engaging? Would Don't Not learn the mistakes from the first game? Would they incorporate more than two endings? Would the story not 
not be dog shit? Would I not hate every single character? I had all these questions going into the game. And then, uh, something weird happened. Because I almost liked this game. Yeah, I'm, uh, not kidding. I almost enjoyed a Life is Strange game. It wasn't a masterpiece or anything, but I could recommend it to a few people. And after the first two episodes, I was fully willing to give this game a 6 out of 10. But then, uh, Chapter 3 happened. And then the, uh, the rest of the game happened. Here's the thing. Life is Strange 2 is the best game in the series. I liked it. But remember, that means it's the best game in the Life is Strange series. A series that so far has two 3 out of 10 games. And overall, this game is a 5 in my book. Despite massive improvements, this game also has a massive inconsistency issue. And by golly, I'm gonna talk about it. Real quick, I am playing the PC version. This game hasn't been remastered, which is really weird. Not that it needs one, but at least a Switch port. I played through episode 1, then Captain Spirit, then the rest of the game. Captain Spirit, of course, being the free prequel spinoff about the Captain Spirit. And like before the storm, a lot of my opinions are from my first playthrough of the game. So I had about a week to form these opinions. So once again, I'm not gonna be as concise as the first game. But with all that out of the way, let's travel the open road and cross the border. I am never saying that again. Part 1, the things that are better. Now, unlike before the storm, I actually have a lot to say here. First of all, the premise is better. So the game starts off with this really weird police tape, where an officer is killed by a mysterious explosion. It's a lot more eerie and mysterious and really draws you in. But now it's time for the real story to begin. So in this game, the main character is Sean, a 16-year-old half-Mexican high schooler living in Seattle, living with his single dad and his nine-year-old brother, Daniel. We're also introduced to this girl and this dickhead of a neighbor. Hey, lovebirds. Shut the fuck up. What do you say? And at first I was like, oh great, this is gonna be the first game again, isn't it? You have the Chloe Price character, you have the dickhead Nathan type character, and for about 30 minutes it really feels like it's going in that direction. But then, Sean's dad is shot and killed by the officer you saw in the intro. And it turns out the explosion from the intro is actually from Daniel, your little brother who has superpowers. So for the rest of the game, you and Daniel are running from the law. You have to teach Daniel to harness his psychokinesis powers and be a father figure to him while not really knowing how to survive yourself. And I like this premise a lot more. It feels like this game took inspirations from The Last of Us. Looks like it. Click okay, well, it isn't subtle about it. Okay, okay, I get it. Oh. In spite of the game's lack of subtlety, and while I still have problems with the game's writing, because trust me, uh, it ain't great. Do you think there are werewolves for real? Dude, we are the wolves. Oh! The whole Last of Us God of War thing of following a little child around and teaching them skills along the way may not be the most original concept, but I found it to be much more engaging. Especially when the law is always one step behind you. I remember this one Life is Strange comment I got saying that I was stupid because I think games need non-stop action. Obviously, this is an extreme straw man and not true at all. But after getting much more engaged in Life is Strange 2's higher stakes concept, you could probably be able to fool some people. Because yeah, Life is Strange 2 has a bit more action and excitement in it, and I enjoyed it more. I don't know, maybe games do need more non-stop action. Ironically, though, in the first two chapters, it's the slower, more intimate scenes with Sean and Daniel that I found to be really good. Also, I gotta give Sean some praise, too. In my opinion, he is a way better character than Max Caulfield. Max was really bland, probably intentionally, but I just didn't find myself caring about her that much. However, I was much more engaged with the character of Sean. Sean is still a kid, 16 years old, in fact, but with his dad now dead and that memory fresh in his head. He now has to be a father figure for Daniel. And you get the impression he doesn't quite know what he's doing. So Sean is always on the fine line between maturity and immaturity. Once again, the character is running from the law and living in the woods. So you have to choose between survival and morality. Choosing whether to break the law to keep yourself alive or keeping your head down and being a good influence on Daniel. And depending on what you do, you can either influence him positively or negatively. Now this aspect isn't perfect and I'll get to that later. But Sean and Daniel themselves, uh, they ate. The core of their interactions, I I think is fairly well done. And these quieter, more intimate moments are very heartwarming. Now, I don't think Sean is an amazing character or anything. And the way he's actually written is very hit or miss. His inner monologues can get really grating at points. And oftentimes he'll just state the obvious. You know, a triple A gaming dialogue. It's almost a problem with the genre where most of it is tell, don't show. But here it's kind of amplified. It's almost like that gothic remake demo from a couple years back. Where the writers confuse charisma with constant nervous talking. Oh, fuck. Oh shit. Fuck. Oh, fuck my bag. What? Wow. Right. Great. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Hey, I'm okay, Nathan Drake. Right. But you know what? He gets the damn job done. He's a perfectly fine protagonist, and in my opinion, a very big step up from Max Caulfield. Overall, I think Sean is a perfectly fine protagonist. Now, I saw a couple people complain about the side characters in this game, and how they're not nearly as memorable as the ones in the first game. Now, of course, I hated everyone in the first game, so this wasn't exactly a problem for me. But, and this may sound kind of weird, but I kind of liked how quote-unquote less memorable these side characters were. But this is for two reasons. First of all, it fits the point of the story. The two protagonists are trying to run to Mexico, so they can live prosperously in their father's old house. Of course, they're going to meet a lot of random people along the way, but you don't have time to sit and chat with them. For the first two chapters, instead of holding the story back like in the first game, the side characters are instead of pushing the story forward, and allowing that feeling of traveling the open road and meeting these alien people in these alien places. You get a new character every chapter, which leads to this sense of alienation, which is really fitting for the plot. The second reason reason I like them not being as memorable is because they don't lose focus of the story. For the first two episodes, they aren't invasive at all. This allows focus to be where focus needs to be, on Sean and Daniel and their relationship. The side characters add on to that, but they don't ever take away from it, for the first two episodes. There's clearly a bigger emphasis on this game being this more artistic, I guess. Art. The biggest example for me being the way the game recaps previous episodes. So in the first two games, when you began a new episode, it would recap the previous one like a TV show. Previously on Life is Strange Before the Storm. There wasn't much to criticize or anything because they got the job done, but they were really tacky and reminded me of that shitty Alone in the Dark reboot from 2008. Is what I would say if that game wasn't a masterpiece. Previously on Alone in the Dark. Now give me my stone! I don't have your stone and fuck you anyway! In Life is Strange 2, however, the story is recapped very interestingly, being presented as a story about two wolves that Sean is telling to Daniel, with each animal representing a certain character. A little pretentious, but it is really creative, and a far cry from generic Degrassi knockoff. Once upon a time, in a wild, wild world, there were two wolf brothers. What exactly is a furry, and how do you know if you are one? Hey everyone! My name is Gustavo, but you can call me Gus. <laughs> Finally, I said to myself, this is a massive improvement. This is what I'm talking about. A story that isn't convoluted or anything. The main two characters are relatively likable and have good chemistry. Daniel's a little annoying, but he's a nine-year-old kid, so it's okay. The side characters add to the atmosphere and themes and push the story forward. And hell, even the graphics are better. The facial animations are kind of stiff, but the animations, especially when Sean is in movement, are really good. And the lighting and environments are way better. It's a lot more clear what is and isn't isn't an artistic choice in this game. This is in contrast to the last two games, which, and I didn't mention this, because I didn't know if it was a budgetary problem or not, but I don't like how those games look. All the textures are disgustingly blurry. The animations are hella stiff. The game is literally graphically on par with fucking Half-Life 2, but this game just looks so much better. It goes to show what higher fidelity can really bring to a game. Not to say it's perfect, of course. Some textures look, yeah, not the best. Again, the faces look kinda stiff, and there's this fuck ugly motion blur. That you can't turn off without going into an any file. What? Why? Nobody in the fucking universe likes motion blur. I shouldn't have to hack the fucking Pentagon to turn off motion blur. So while there are some problems, this is so far not that bad. There's no possible way they can fuck this up. Part two, the stuff I'm mixed about. How they fuck it up. Okay, well, not completely fuck it up. That will be saved for later. Oh. But this is just in general stuff I'm so far mixed about in the first two episodes. The stuff that's not a horrible, but not great either. So in the first game, I hated the dialogue and the writing. Just absolute garbage. And I've got to say, in all honesty, um, photo bomb, photo hog. It's the biggest piece of dog shit that I have ever heard. Characters are just spouting slang and pop culture terms. And not only is it unrealistic, it also gets really annoying really fast. So how is Life is Strange 2? Well, I will say this: it's not as bad as the original game. It should change us so fast. I get so emo Okay, sometimes. never mind. And thankfully, this cringy dialogue is a lot less frequent, and for the most part, the game understands that humans have to talk like humans. However, while the writing is better, I can't really call it good. It still tends to be way too wistful at points, making characters seem way too overdramatic, as if the game is trying way too hard to be emotional. There are some genuinely good dialogue exchanges in this game, but there's also just really bad ones. And of course, we must not forget the booze. Ain't you? The booze. 
What is it? Get the fuck out of the pro! This is a birthday card for my little sister. Hey, since you're such a pro big bro, what's a good way to end this letter? Well, what is she into? Like, anime or... Man, if you don't cut that shit out. So unlike the first game, where all the dialogue is all bad all the time, the sequel is much more hit or miss. Which may be an improvement from the first game, but to quote a wise captain... That was an improvement, but it's not hard to improve on garbage. Here's another thing. I said earlier I like how the side characters are handled in the story. However, while I like their placement in the story, I have problems with the characters themselves. Quite a few of them, especially later in the game, are just straight up garbage. The hippie characters in episode 3 are a prime example example of this. So at the end of chapter 2 you meet some hippie characters, and in episode 3 you end up living with them. In fact, the entirety of episode 3 is pretty much about them. Which firstly, I felt really halted the progression between Sean and Daniel, and ruined the forward moving momentum the story had in the first two episodes. But the bigger issue is that these characters are just so fucking boring. They take the story way off track, but it's really not worth it at all, because I really don't find these characters engaging. And this is a problem with the second half of the game. Entire episodes are dedicated to these side characters who don't have the depth to compensate or justify an entire episode. And thankfully these characters never quite reach the lows of say Chloe Price, but Don't Not still haven't fully learned their lesson about bad side characters. Which sucks because for the first two chapters I thought they almost did. Another thing that's really mixed is the choice system. I'll get to how certain choices affect the endings later, but what I do like is this. The game is dependent on you being a good role model to Daniel, and this actually affects him throughout the story. Finally, your choices matter. It only took two fucking games, except actually, uh, not really, because your choices literally only affect the ending and nothing else in the story, and all of them will lead you to the exact same outcome. The story never really changes at all, not until the last minute anyways. I understand these kinds of games aren't easy to make, but it still feels like for a good majority of the story, your actions don't truly affect the narrative. They affect certain events in the narrative, but those events would have just ended there anyways. Take for example, Captain Spirit. At the end of chapter 2, Daniel before friends him, and he can either avoid getting hit by a car, help you escape, or get hit by a car. I don't have your stone, and fuck you anyway. But it really doesn't matter because this is where his character ends. The next time you see him is in a JPEG in one of the endings. Once again, this specific event may change, but the story never does. It's the same problem the original game had and Don't Nod didn't really learn their lesson. Yes, the choices in the game are a lot better, but I wouldn't call them good or even really impactful. Overall, in spite of multiple improvements, the game is still far from ideal. But the flaws I listed are what I would call double-edged swords. They definitely hinder the experience, but don't outright ruin it. In other words, they don't entirely fuck up the game. So now here's the shit that does fuck up the entire game. Part 3, Captain Spirit is garbage. Before we talk about the actual game, let's talk about the free spin-off Captain Spirit and how much it sucks. So right before Life is Strange 2 came out, Donut released this free little game that's essentially a one-hour backstory for Captain Spirit, who, like I said earlier, is a character who appears for one chapter. This game was made as one big commercial and it really feels like it. You follow Captain Spirit Spirit, or Chris. He's a little kid who lives with a single dad, and role plays as Captain Spirit, a superhero he made up in his backyard. Now, when I first heard of this game, and heard that it was a quote-unquote emotional experience, I thought to myself, okay, judging what Donut has done and hasn't done so far, either the kid lost his mom and that's the big emotional moment, or the mom left the family and the dad is an abusive prick. Turns out after playing it, um, both were right. Captain Spirit's mom died and that's why he's Captain Spirit, to cope and seethe with it. But it's also the reason his dad is a drunk, alcoholic, abusive piece of shit. Captain Spirit also has an arch nemesis named Mantroid, and he got the name Mantroid from the two streets his mom died on in an intersection. Of course, these themes are never properly explored. And just when you think it is, Captain Spirit ends with a sequel bait teaser ending. That's it? It feels like a cheap emotional bait and switch. Oh, you thought this would be a cute game, huh? Well, it's actually about abuse and death that we use to promote our second game that you should buy right now. Furthermore, when chapter two ends, that's once again where Captain Spirit's entire character ends. He's still living with his dad, at least if you choose the ending where he lives. So he just kind of goes with the abuse? Wow, what a great moral. Just deal with your abuse. This isn't really even explored in Life is Strange 2 anyways. You have to get Chris to open up about it. Which 
I get it, the story's not about him. Well, then why did you make an entire prequel about him? And if he dies, well, that's even worse. So you made this nine-year-old kid character who lost his mom and gets beat by his drunk dad. Only for you to cheaply kill him off. What the fuck is wrong with you, don't not? The Captain Spirit literally ends with his dad blaming him for his wife's death. And then Life is Strange 2 Episode 2 happens like nothing fucking happened. Jesus. Stop that whining. What the fuck did you just say to me? You're not a baby anymore. Oh, boo-hoo, daddy. Grow up. Try me, you fucking weasel! Even when you do confront Chris's dad about this, he just kind of goes, yeah, I'm a horrible person. I'll work on it. Well, are you going to? Don't nod. You do realize that this is bad, right? This isn't respectful to abuse victims or anything. You're not doing anything positive by writing shit like this. You're just using incredibly dark subject matter to create cheap emotional drama that doesn't go anywhere anyway. On top of using that to market another video game you have to buy. God fucking damn it, it's Kate Mar- Marsh all over again. It's just really distasteful. If Don't Not just followed through on these themes and gave this shit proper resolution, this wouldn't be nearly as much of a problem. But it is, and that's really just awful. Don't Not really should be ashamed of themselves for this. You gotta be ashamed of yourself. Real talk. Part 4, chapters 3 through 5 are garbage. Now, up to this point, you may have noticed something. A lot of the positives I said are given a big disclaimer. That disclaimer being for the first two chapters. Because for the first two chapters, the game is indeed a 6 out of 10. It's certainly nowhere near perfect, and I wasn't ready to call it good yet. But like I said earlier, there are plenty of good elements in here. And if the game just coasted along like it was, I wouldn't really have a problem with it. However, at the end of chapter 2 and beginning in chapter 3, the game just absolutely nosedives in quality. With chapter 3 being an absolute snore fest, chapter 4 being absolute what? dog shit, and chapter 5 being slightly better but not great at all, and it's ultimately too little too late. But firstly, chapter 3. So at the end of chapter 2, you meet Cassidy and Finn, who are two hippies living out in the woods. In chapter 3, you then end up living with all the hippies, and you do stuff like cut weed. To put it in other words, you ain't got no weed! I said earlier in the video that I think all these characters are really boring. They do indeed have backstories, and I guess that's commendable. But they also don't really do anything. And once again, most of them really only exist in this one episode. So you get less of a reason to learn or care about them. All on top of them already being really underwritten characters. You literally meet one of them for the first time topless. Cassidy is probably the second most important character out of these hippies. But she's still pretty uninteresting. And she feels like nothing more than a sex object for you to romance. Maybe this works We're in like Mass Effect, but not in this game at all. And because she doesn't really carry you over into the rest of the story, not to mention the chapter ends the exact same way no matter what happens, with you getting caught in a heist and the building blowing up and you losing your eye, pretty much anything else she can do is superficial. You can literally make her hate you in chapter 3, only for her to send you a nice letter in the next episode no matter what happens. And this is the equivalent to the theater scene in Before the Storm. It's very not good. The most important character in this chapter out of the hippies is Finn. But not only is he again really boring and pretty forgettable personality wise, but he also helps to distract the story from where I think the focus should have been. Daniel almost becomes a really minor side character and Finn becomes a lot more prominent. I get what they're trying to do. Sean hasn't been around cool people his age for a while and he looks up to these hippie characters and wants to spend time with them. But Daniel gets jealous and that it hurts Sean and Daniel's relationship. You're always with them. Bet you don't even want me around anymore. However, what ultimately ends up happening is the feeling of the story losing focus. Yeah, I get the idea behind it, but now that good story of Sean and Daniel growing together is kind of being minimized for cheap drama, I feel. It once again just feels really inconsistent. And not to mention, Daniel comes off as really spoiled and just really ungrateful. Just a massive backstep for the character. Once again, I get the attempt here, but I wish they chose something better. There is one scene, however, that I like in this chapter, and that's this campfire scene. Where the characters sit around and talk about the worst moments in their lives. And while not award-winning, it's pretty well written. Sean and Daniel are still coping from the loss of their dad. So this one scene of all the hippies sitting around, having this makeshift group therapy session is just so heartwarming. And it feels like the most natural progression of the story's theme. I think this is what the chapter should have been about. It should have been more introspective. In an otherwise really mediocre chapter, this scene really stands out. It really sucks that Don't Nod couldn't put away the contrivances for a minute. Because there truly is some 
something here. Too bad, uh, they fuck it up in chapter four. And this is where shit gets really fucky. Almost all of this chapter is dedicated to this cult. A cult that for one episode indoctrinates Daniel into it. And who the cult leader uses to further her power. And all of this is out of complete left field. Religion is not a major talking point until literally now. And as soon as the episode ends, that's it. All the characters act like it never fucking happened. This chapter just feels really pointless. All the people in the cult feel like stereotypical bad guys. Just the most obvious example of bad religious figure you can think of. They don't feel like actual religious scumbags. But more so a, a Far Cry 5 type portrayal. In fact, I think Far Cry 5 might be more realistic than Life is Strange 2. What's the lesson I'm supposed to learn? That cults are bad? I already fucking know this! He spoke to me and told me that I was doing right. And the Lord told me that I love voicemail. Oh God, I love voicemail. I'm stroking my dick. This is an extremely basic criticism of religion. And it's not that you can't criticize religion at all. There are quite a few works that I think do it way better. And of course, you should be allowed to criticize religion. But this is that lazy emo the musical type criticism. Wow, that's a movie I have not thought about in a while. It's the same shit you heard before, just packaged differently. It also has literally nothing to do with anything. Once again, religion isn't a topic until now. What's even more weird is that Life is Strange is an overtly more political game, dealing with themes of racism and xenophobia. But the cult isn't even racist, they're just kinda crazy. It's like Dodna didn't know what else to do with this story. So they wrote in this really lazy Christian criticism into the story. It just feels like it has nothing to do with anything at all. A society. Oh, and don't even get me started on the worst character in the story. Sean and Daniel's mother. This fucking mistake of a character and plot point. She's pretty much the face of everything wrong with Dodnod's writing style. So early on in the game, it's known that Sean and Daniel's mother left the family. So there's a lot of animosity towards her. To the point where their grandparents barely even consider her their daughter anymore. But then out of nowhere in episode four, oh shit, she's here. Conveniently at the same time when Sean's trying to free Daniel from the cult. Deus Ex Machina-ing herself into the plot. Okay, so her insertion is a little sloppy. But honestly, that's the least of her problems. So get this, the reason she left Sean and Daniel's family, and the reason she put everyone else into turmoil, is because she got tired of being a mom and wanted to be free. Why did you bail on us? I wasn't meant to be a wife, or a mother. I thought I was supposed to. I tried to pretend for many years, but I was unhappy, and the urge to leave just became unbearable. I had no other choice. Are you serious? You chose this life. You fell in love. You made your own choices. Making your own choices doesn't mean you can never fool yourself, Sean. What does that mean? Also, judging by the condoms whoa, in her bag, whoa, whoa, this woman belongs whoa, whoa, in the whoa, fucking hey, street. Hey, hey, and yet, and here's the crazy part, you're supposed to sympathize with her. You're supposed to forgive her on principle and feel bad for her, but I genuinely can't. Not when her reasoning for leaving is, I got too lazy to be a mom. And you're not truly allowed to dislike her either. And trust me, I fucking tried. You're forced to work with her and to some extent accept her as your mom. But you can't truly call her out on her bullshit. Nor are you given a good reason to forgive her. It's the same problem a character like Chloe Price had, where she does a whole bunch of terrible shit to you, but you can't truly call her out on her bullshit, nor does the character go through any significant arcs. Furthermore, once again, this is an example of a plot point that further convolutes the story. What could have been a story about Sean and Daniel finding their own family within themselves, suddenly gets the Star Wars ass extra family member thrown in. This is just a really sloppily put together character. Don't nod, genuinely could not help themselves. The whole mom is issue carries over into chapter 5. It's not really fixed, more so it's ended. Most of the chapter is dicking around in this rock civilization, albeit with some wholesome moments in it. The Sean and Daniel chemistry is back on track. It is admittedly fun and heartwarming to play a hot and cold and build structures with Daniel. It makes the past two chapters feel even more like filler. I want to bond with Daniel. I want to do this shit. I don't want to hang with hippies or fight a church cult or talk to my missing mom. The problem with chapter 5 is it makes the past two chapters look worse. It has all the stuff I wanted from the game, all the stuff chapters 1 and 2 promise, and yet the game just kind of goes on pause for two chapters. The game loses focus and adds a lot of fluff to the story, but it's fluff that isn't nearly as interesting as the game thinks it is. The game is very obviously inspired by The Last of Us, Let's go golfing. but even though Joel and Ellie weren't exactly the best of friends starting off, and while they did fight throughout the story, the game still had a forward-moving momentum. The game was focused on Joel and Ellie. There were side characters, but 
they didn't distract from the story. If anything, they added to it. Life is Strange 2 doesn't really do that, however, which is a damn shame because if it did, this could have been a pretty decent experience. Oh, before I end this segment, uh, David's also in Chapter 5. He's voiced by the shitty before the storm voice actor for some reason. And after the death of Chloe and or Arcadia Bay, he's now living in the rocks and pretty much 180'd on his hyper aggressive personality. It's weird seeing him so out of character, but it makes sense at least. But still, his inclusion feels like it's more there for a quick reference because he really doesn't do anything. I kind of wish they did a little bit more with his character. David was one of the few not completely dog shit parts of the first game, and I wish they kind of continued that here. Overall, this part of the game is just really frustrating. Don't Nod can't write anything good to save their lives. Man, I'm gonna. I'm gonna break my monitor, I swear! Part 5, Political. Oh great, a reason for people to get mad at me now. Now, a quick disclaimer, I don't have a problem with Life is Strange 2 being political, or even what it's trying to say. In fact, contextually, it makes quite a bit of sense. So yeah, Life is Strange 2 is a much more political game this time around. The first game touched on politics, in the same way that political YouTubers touch on not making me want to shove a shotgun down my throat and blow my fucking brains out. Sam Hyde calls out ha -san with see a bizarre box say something. I'm going to end the problem really is on the people who are yelling at Sam Hyde about the party. But now, Life is Strange 2 is actually political, discussing themes of immigration, xenophobia, and racism. Now, this is not a bad thing on its own, and I cannot stress enough my problem is not with the themes themselves. The issue, however, is that how the themes are handled is just not very good. Uh, actually, um,. It was horrible. You'll meet these racist characters throughout the game. And not that this in itself is the problem. However, the issue is that they're written like this. Sing something. <laughs> it's so fucking goofy. Don't not just it can't do subtlety or nuance correctly. So when they try to write a sad scene where Sean gets bullied by a racist, and it's meant to be a really sad scene, it's immediately ruined when they decide to have Sean sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Don't nod, known for forcing dead memes into their works. That was an epic win. That's what the kids call epic fail. Or somehow unable to stop themselves in the face of these serious topics. You're the reason we need to build that wall. Shut your ass up. <laughs> The politics serve less to give the story a sense of finality or deeper meaning, and instead almost halt the story's immersion and pacing. Like, once again, this is really sloppy stuff, and can even be unnecessary at certain points. For example, near the end of the game, Sean meets these two racists at the border and ends up getting arrested, meeting these two illegal immigrants in his jail cell. And they give this entire expository dialogue on why they're trying to get to the US, but yet you already had that with Sean and Daniel. You had an entire game with these two characters with the exact same thing. Themes. that can easily show you the perspective of why someone would want to immigrate to somewhere else. And furthermore, these two characters only exist in this scene here. They're essentially only here to say that xenophobia is bad, which once again is not a bad theme. It's just that this breaks the rule of show don't tell. This is like a fucking David Cage move. Leave her alone! Leave her alone! Show me this guy's balls, please. It really sucks because if the game did play to its strengths, these could have been relatively decent themes in the game. These issues could have pushed the story forward, give greater narrative depth. Hopefully you get what I'm saying here. The themes of anti-xenophobia are not themselves bad by any means, but the game is shit at expressing them. I can't take them seriously. They cannibalize the story. It's this really weird, somewhat small thing that just really hurts the story. These aspects needed more time in the oven. Anyways, I'm gonna move on before some political channel makes it fun video on me. Why you boring me? I'm right! Part 6, the ending. So after the shit endings of the other game, and after being told Life is Strange 2 has seven whole endings, this got me optimistic about the endings of the game. So I beat the game and- So that was a fucking lie. So there aren't actually seven endings in the game. In reality, there are four endings, but two of them have a couple of variants. In one ending, you can get the girl from the beginning of the game to show up in the background somewhere. And in the other one, if you romance Cassidy or Finn, you can get a JPEG of them at the end of the game. So yeah, yeah, there aren't actually seven endings, but rather four, which are still tied to your last minute choices at the end of the game, uh -huh. but they're also dependent on Daniel's morality and how you taught him throughout the game. And depending on what you taught him and what choices you make, he'll either obey you or disobey you. I got the ending where Daniel uses his powers to help Sean escape to Mexico and the two of them start their own car garage. There's one ending where you two turn yourselves in and Sean and Daniel reunite years later. There's one ending where Daniel refuses to surrender and tries to force himself into Mexico, but gets Sean killed in the process and ends up living in Mexico. Mexico by himself. And then there's the ending where Sean escapes to Mexico. But Daniel jumps out of the car at the last minute, turning himself in. I'm a villain, not a monster. 
And yeah, I thought, unlike the first game, which is a lazy fucking cop-out, this is better. And while not perfect, this is, initially, an improvement. There are both more endings and more dynamic choices. So these are good endings, right? Uh, no, they're not. The problem is with the endings themselves. So the climactic border fight scene is pretty good. Because as we all know, games need action because they're not good otherwise. But then, after this scene, you get a completely quiet AMV ending. There are no sound in these. Not even a generic monologue. These endings are completely mute. This makes these endings feel very awkward and rushed, and not to mention really anticlimactic. The issue is that none of these endings really cap off the game in a meaningful way. None of the themes or personal character threads feel truly resolved, and you're kind of left sitting there going, that's it? That's all the game has to offer? You have all these political themes and characters, all this personal shit between Sean and Daniel, and this is how you choose to end it? I really don't think it would have hurt to add an extra dialogue exchange. It's just something that adds a sense of finality to these endings. Nothing feels satisfying or anything. Yes, there are more endings. And they're better implemented endings. But the endings themselves aren't good endings. It's almost an allegory for my thoughts on the game as a whole. It's an improvement, but it ain't exactly good. Which in that case, maybe these are the perfect endings. And these should have had more time in the oven. These feel super rushed. Better luck next time, I guess. Part 7, Conclusion. Man, this just makes me sad. Because believe it or not, a part of me wants to like this. Life is Strange 2 is genuinely an improvement over the first game. The thing is, is while there are indeed improvements to the game, the complete nosedive in quality just hurts this game. What starts off as a really promising first two episodes ends up being a complete oh, mixed wow. bag. From the inconsistent and pointless plot threads, to some of these horrible and or boring characters, to the really poorly implemented political themes, on top of the Life is Strange-ism dialogue still being there, it's just really inconsistent. This is indeed the best Life is Strange game, but even then it's nothing more than it's not that bad. Which honestly is not enough to turn me around on this series. I don't know, maybe someone will enjoy this more than me. But in the end, this was to me a 5 out of 10 experience. Last time I recommended Night in the Woods over the original game. In this case, I recommend God of War. That game tackles a very similar story. You got this kid who's really special and grows to be a snobby brat. You have Kratos who has to teach him how to behave. They also lost an important family figure at the beginning of the game. But in Life is Strange 2, a lot of the drama feels contrived. While in God of War, the drama feels like very meticulous and intentional decision making. Where the drama comes from not just trying to include characters bickering or something, but also trying to fully flesh out these characters. Atreus needs to learn maturity and restraint. Kratos has to get over his grief and his past and his guilt. By the end of God of War 2018, I was genuinely tearing up. All the many endings of Life is Strange 2 made me go, that's it? <laughs> Overall, check it out if you can. It's one of my favorite games of all time. In conclusion, Life is Strange 2 is a mixed bag, but I almost liked it. It's a shame the game wouldn't stop cannibalizing itself. Because if it didn't, maybe it would have been something special. Oh, and uh, Chloe wasn't in it, so uh, it's actually a test. I had to reach up to get to the cherry on the top. Got it. Oh, in the mouth. It was lovely. Then onto the ice cream. Mm, and the chocolate sauce. <laughs> Dig in. That was uh, a bit rich, but okay. Then there was some... Um, Jelly stuff, and actually, um, that wasn't very nice. Uh, actually, um, it was horrible. Now, I was filling my cheeks so as not to taste it so much. Then, I got to the trifle, soggy cake, and that was even more horrible. I couldn't bear to put it in my mouth. I couldn't even put it in my cheeks. I hunched my shoulders and plop, spat some. On my plate. I don't like it very much. What are you doing? Adding this to the pile. No freaking. Okay, let's just get into it, okay? I found a really cheap Steam key for Life is Strange Remastered. And since I skipped the Life is Strange Farewell DLC, I decided, yeah, fuck it. Really rushed bonus video time. I mean, it would be good to go over all the stuff I missed in the previous video, Even if it's all just endless dog shit. But first of all, what won't I be covering? Well, I won't be covering that TV show because it's, uh, not out yet. But rest assured, it's in good hands. Especially since the executive producer is Shawn Mendes, the pop song writer behind Stitches, one of the worst songs ever ever made. 
have legalized nuclear bombs. I mean, for real, no destroy lonely on this track? Not only that, but Shawn Mendes has no experience being an executive producer whatsoever, with the exception of a Netflix documentary about himself. He might as well make fucking Future the showrunner at this point. So rest assured, it's a, in very good hands. There's also a Life is Strange comic book series. They continue the riveting adventures of Chloe and Max, and they're completely non-canon. I haven't uh, read it myself, of course, at least not in full, so I couldn't tell you how amazing it is. However, the first line you read is, OMG, Maxi Max, these look friggin' awesome. If that's not indicative of the overall quality, I couldn't tell you what is. Anyway, it's time for me to rush this video out or something. Uh, Life is Strange Remastered is fucking garbage. Okay, first question, why do these exist? When you make a remastered version of a game, it's usually to preserve that game. I remember when at launch, the PS4 and Xbox One didn't have backwards compatibility. So on top of, you know, making money, the whole appeal was, hey, remember that game you missed out on years ago? Well, we fixed it up a little bit and brought it to modern platforms, so here you go, remastered. It's same for current gen, albeit to a much lesser extent. Although in this current gen's case, the focus seems to be natively porting the game with 60 frames and higher resolutions, which I'm okay with, especially in the case of PS4 exclusive games. A lot of those games are locked to 900p 30 or however the numbers are, so a better running port is pretty much asked for. But in the case of Life is Strange, I don't think that's required. The game is a fully narrative-driven experience, or in layman's terms, there's no actual gameplay and it's really, really easy. The game is pretty much made for people who don't like video games, and the quote-unquote challenge comes down to the choices you make, which of course don't actually matter, but that's beside the point. Here's the point I'm getting at. Life is Strange is already on PS4 and Xbox One. Two consoles that are backwards compatible on PS5 and Xbox Series X, respectively. So why is the game getting remastered? It's already been preserved relatively well. And the Xbox version even has FPS boost, so you can play the original Life is Strange game at 60 frames on current platforms. Of course, before the storm doesn't, but who honestly cares? And obviously you have the good old PC version, which can pretty much run however the fuck you want it to run. So a remaster is already really pointless, because once again, these games are already preserved really well. So what are the benefits to Life is Strange Remastered? Well, the game's in a native 4K now. Okay, uh, nice. And the game would eventually get a 60 FPS patch. Wait a minute, you couldn't get 60 frames at launch? Aren't these Xbox 360 games or something? God damn it, these games are on iPhone. And your aim wasn't to make a native 4K 60 version of them? Well, better late than never, I I guess. Unless you're, of course, an Xbox Series S user, which means you're stuck at 30 frames per second, which means that on Xbox Series S, the original game, thanks to frame boost, runs better than the next generation remaster. So what was the point then? Oh, of course, the actual point is the new and enhanced graphics, where all the characters look like plastic Barbie dolls. Look, the OG game wasn't much of a looker, but at least it was kind of intentional and made on a pretty small budget. I mentioned before that I'm not a big fan of the look of these games. The animations are really stiff, and the textures are disgustingly muddy, but the game was kind of trying to have a photograph look and turn the low budget into something stylistic. The remaster tries to fix some of these issues, but ends up trampling over the art style, and in many cases, even looking worse. Look at Mr. Jefferson, the fuck's going on with his goddamn teeth? Why does the new lighting make everything look dark? The new faces are still really stiff, and honestly, barely noticeable, and sometimes don't even fit emotionally with the scene. That drunk jackass only cares about cash for Blackwell Academy. Don't trust him. That drunk jackass only cares about cash for Blackwell Academy. Don't trust him. Also, certain models just look way worse. You'll get a pretty high quality, realistic Chloe model. Standing five feet from, dear God, what the hell is this? Now, I've heard this remaster has more bugs and glitches in it. Now, I'm gonna be honest. I really only played the first chapters of Before the Storm and the original game, as well as the Farewell DLC from Before the Storm. I have no clue if the game gets better or worse from there on out, and I'm not playing more of these games to find out. Fuck that shit. But from what I've played, chapter one of the original game and Before the Storm aren't too glitchy, I didn't really notice anything. But the farewell chapter, dear God, Chloe's eyes, what's going on here? Max will literally clip through objects and just hold and move them in the air. And people are still reporting bugs and glitches, by the way. For a game that came out nine months ago? This isn't exactly cyberpunk, guys. The fuck are you doing? You already have more stable versions of these games. What incentive is there to buying a worse version of it? Literally, the only new thing is the Switch 
port. So if you have a Switch, congratulations, you're now infected. But now, since they're the remaster, you can bet your ass they're going to be incredibly less optimized, as opposed to just a native port of the original versions of these games. Honest to God, who was this made for? The games are already well preserved, so it's not for new people. And as for old Life is Strange fans, do they really want a butchered version of a game, half of which isn't even the original vision? In conclusion, these remasters suck. Putting aside the franchise for a minute, these are an incredible waste of money. Do not buy these. And I've got to say, in all honesty, um, it's the biggest piece of dog shit that I have ever- Second part of the video, Life is Strange Farewell is mid as fuck. So in my Before the Storm video, I briefly mentioned Life is Strange Farewell, that DLC only included in the Deluxe Edition, and hey, it's in the remastered version, so let's talk about it. So how is this DLC that's locked behind a $10 Deluxe paywall? Well, let me tell ya, it's really boring. Literally, the whole thing is just Chloe and Max dicking around as children. But then, at the end, Max tells Chloe that she's leaving. But then, turns out Chloe knew the whole time Time, I guess. But Chloe's like, it's okay, we'll contact each other. And then Chloe's dad dies, I guess. And that's the whole story of the game. They locked this shit behind a paywall. Oh, but uh, it's emotional how they're leaving each other. Shut the fuck up. Ass. Like, what new information am I supposed to gain out of this? That Chloe's dad is dead? Wow, I didn't have two games already that told me this. That Chloe and Max were best friends as children? Oh, wow. I couldn't have inferred that from the first fucking game. Now, there is one other other thing in this bonus episode. So Chloe and Max's voice actresses are back. Okay, that's whatever, I guess. And uh, that's it. That is the whole thing. A complete waste of fucking money. I'm actually shocked Life is Strange fans like this. This is a blatant scam. So you're paying an extra $10 for a 40 minute DLC that's completely bare bones and adds nothing to the world or lore. And you still cried over it? Like you really like this shit? Are Life is Strange fans the kinds of people who fall for the Nigerian Prince email scams? Whatever you do, don't be like me. Don't waste your money. Please don't buy this shit. The Life is Strange Farewell chapter is a waste of money. There are so many games both on sale and off sale, both new and pre-owned, full games in fact, that you can buy for $10. Let me go on Steam real quick. Half-Life, Half-Life 2, Portal 2, KOTOR, Hotline Miami, Dishonored, Max Payne, Fallout 3, Deus Ex, System Shock 2, Psychonauts, Hootie Whoa. Pop, much longer, more complete experiences, $10 or less. I don't care if it's DLC, this is pointless. Life is Strange a Farewell is terrible, and to lock it behind a deluxe edition vault with no way to buy it individually is even worse. Don't buy this bare bones piece of shit, you'll be wasting your time and money. So in conclusion, Conclusion, uh, this franchise sucks, and uh, yeah, can't wait for Life is Strange Modern Warfare. So we kind of had to entertain ourselves. Like, I know I'm supposed to talk Body's about What? We, we want, want Night in the, the Woods and life, life is strange. strange! You have Night in the Woods and Life is Strange at home! Goodbye Volcano High is the latest game in the Dear God, just play Night in the Woods instead genre. This game is a PS4, PS5, and PC exclusive. So sadly, the Switch users, the target demographic, can't play it. Oh god, it's Persona all over again! So this game has been the eye of ridicule and controversy for a bit of a while. This game was announced at the PS5 Future of Gaming show, aka the the place where they were announcing the PS5. So imagine, you know, you're getting all hyped up for like, you know, Ratchet and Clank, Demon Souls, Spider-Man. Then you see this shit. What the fuck is this shit? However, when I saw the trailer, I thought something very different. Oh my God. I have to review this. Everything from it being a high school game like Life is Strange, to the fact the game is a furry garbage, which, I mean, hey, they give me fucking money. I mean, look, man, I'm just saying, don't fight the hand that feeds you, am I right? The fact that the game just doesn't look very good, it appealed to me in all of the wrong ways. However, the red flags went beyond just a few trailers and my own opinion. As this game, which, by the way, is a narrative-driven game, got narratively rebooted and was delayed into 2022. Oh, 
Oh, by the way, uh, the game actually came out like a week ago. Oh, great. Amazing. The game was also apparently part of some harassment campaigns, apparently. A lot of what I've heard is secondhand knowledge, but supposedly some developers got harassed. Some of it, if not most of it, over the fact the main character is non-binary, there's also a trans character in the game, and assumedly members from the queer community have also worked on the game as developers. And yeah, no matter how good or bad the game is, harassing people over LGBTQ plus rep is a deplorable thing. No, please, hold your awards. I do think that homophobia and transphobia is bad. You know, with Hitler, the more I learn about that guy, the more I don't care for him. <laughs> This should obviously be common knowledge, but apparently it isn't. Either way, if you're harassing people over non-binary cartoon dinosaurs, you're probably a really pathetic person. I mean, this guy was a real jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're mad at me for saying something like that, I'm gonna be honest, I don't really care. I listen to JPEG Mafia. <laughs> but of course, obviously, the controversy and how people react to a game and the actual game itself are two different things. But hey, you know, this game seems seems very emotional, I think. Maybe there was someone's dog who thought about how to make the story, like, personal or something. And in my opinion, the best medicine for any kind of negative feedback is to prove people wrong by making a great piece of art. So, does Goodbye Volcano High defy everything by actually being No! In actuality, the game is a complete and utter mess. It's bad. I already had low expectations going into it, and the game ended up not only being underwhelming, but also a completely broken. It includes one of the worst endings I've seen in a long minute. An ending that is a complete waste of time. This is overall not a good game. Do not waste your time with it. And I'm gonna sit here and talk about it for you. Oh, but before I do, and because I know someone's going to bring it up annoyingly, in 2021 and up until 2020, there was a game called Snoot Game that was released. It was made by 4chaners and is one part parody, one part fan game. And now that that's out of the way, let's talk about Goodbye Volcano High and why it sucks. Cue that Midwest emo music, shoddy. Hey, I. Number one, the game is broken. So before anything else, I just want to say this game is broken. It's a uh, pretty buggy, dude, and it just feels really sloppy. I knew I was in for a treat when the game launched on the wrong monitor and not the main monitor that I have checked as my main monitor in my computer setting. And there's no option to change which monitor you're using at all. So I had to put the game into windowed mode, move it over to my main monitor, then put it back into full screen mode. I've rarely ever had that happen to me and every time it has there was always an option to change it Oh well, bit of an early hiccup, but hey, I got it working. Except no, I didn't because I recorded an hour of footage and somehow like the first 10 minutes got fucked up. I was playing in borderless full screen, so I changed to exclusive full screen. And out of complete fear, I used two recording programs to record it this time at the same time. One of them ended up pretty salvageable, thank God. Meanwhile, the other one- Honestly, I was starting to miss them. For the record, I have no clue what happened here. The game has some kind of weird resolution bug, where I guess it displays two resolutions at the same time sometimes. I, I don't know. I have no clue if it's the game itself or just my recording software being fucky. But there was a point where the game randomly minimized on me and changed resolutions for no reason. There are also numerous other bugs. Like, for example, characters randomly disappearing, the screen randomly fading to black for no reason. Practice canceled. Let's find a worm. Okay. Trapaholics makes tapes. There was one part where the game was telling me to press A or X or whatever, but no button was registering. Characters snapping from pose to pose for no reason. The characters' voices randomly getting cut off. Uh, and I had to get Naomi to fix it and everything. I got you. The jiggle my balls. What's up, you fucking tomato? Whoa. Yeah. I also wasn't sure what you'd like, so I have two different types. And apparently I'm not the only one with this problem, because when I complained about it on X, other people also reported things like voice clips getting cut off, somebody got softlocked and had to restart the game. It's just a complete mess. Now, yes, I know this isn't exactly a triple-A team or anything, but again, games like Night in the Woods and even Life is Strange came out perfectly fine. But what's this game's excuse?
and that's on top of the game's presentation itself. Because good lord, that's a whole other thing in and of itself. This is just not a good looking game at all. Nor is it a good sounding game. Now, when this game was coming out, people made fun of the character designs. That's a whole art style thing, and I can't really talk about that too much. But what I can say is the game isn't really convincing me that it looks good either. The game is trying to, you know, look like an anime. Oh, well. And on the surface, yeah, this is impressive sounding. It's like an interactive cartoon anime movie. Whoa! My name is David Cage. But then you actually look at the damn thing and go, oh, wait a minute, this sucks ball. The animations are extremely stiff. A lot of these shots are very flat and look the same. Speaking of flat, look at this rhinoceros. Ew! Did they green screen her mouth on? What's going on here? Austin. How should I feel? This whole thing looks less like an actual, like, a dinosaur a high school anime, and more like a South Park parody of anime. In fact, honestly, I think South Park looks a little bit better than this fucking game. Oh yeah, remember those Ubisoft South Park games? Man, those games were so good, it was like playing through an actual episode of the show. Meanwhile, these characters look like steamroller victims. Whenever their front view happens, they look- uh, oh. Why does this character look like that? What's going on here? What? Sometimes I have to, like, take a step back with how bad this game actually looks. Hello, hello. Hello, dearest lead singer. What the hell is this? The voice acting and sound design is also all over the place. But I can't tell if it's that or the visuals on top of that. But let me explain. Oftentimes, the dialogue will have these really overly long pauses. They're so weirdly slow paced. This makes everything feel completely unnatural. Like the characters are waiting for each other's turn to speak. Or they exist in completely different realities. And it makes the more dramatic moments feel way more drawn out. And again, completely unnatural. The dialogue pacing is just completely completely off in this. Better to accept reality for what it is. No point in getting upset about it. Maybe for you guys, but some of us had plans for the future. Excuse me? Uh, guys. It's easy for you guys to give up on everything. This is how the entire game is, by the way. Also, again, the animation is just awful. So certain times where a character is more excited just isn't communicated visually. And that's on top of just really bad lip syncing. Again, it's just so disjointed. I saw Trish and Reed pop out earlier. Ah! I can't believe they ditched their biggest fans in their hour of triumph. How are you doing that with your mouth? Attempts at humor are also completely just terrible. Because again, everything is just awkward in this game. So attempts at comedy have no sense of flow or timing or anything to them. As a result, the game begotten me looking like this. Like this. Sure, sure. I gotta go. To my locker. But in a shady way. Because I have a terrible secret today. Life is strange somehow did this better. The characters are more prone to interrupt each other or talk right after the other one, which made everything feel more natural overall. Oh, by the way, there are also certain points where both subtitles and even in-game objects don't match up with what the voice actors are saying on screen. Batman, don't stay up late. Nasser, keep up with your homework. Don't misbehave just because we are gone. Call cousin Amal if you need something. What the fuck? A lot of the small stuff just ruins immersion. It just shows an overall lack of polish for this thing. Hey, you know what game was polished? The South Park game. No. No, I can't let you get away. Part two, the gameplay is bad. Yeah, you aren't going to believe this. Uh, they messed up the gameplay in a narrative story-driven game with little gameplay. I genuinely didn't think that was possible, but apparently it is. And there are just a number of really baffling mechanics in this thing. One thing is the dialogue options. There's this weird mechanic where certain options will out of nowhere be grayed out. Depending on which choices you chose earlier. At least sometimes it is. Other times, just a fucking fake out. Now, this is kind of cool on paper, you're building a character as the story goes along. But the stuff that's on a paper should have clearly been crumpled up and thrown away. It actually gives the player less freedom in a certain scenario. And overall, it feels like a random cop-out. If I want to be a needless dick for no reason, let me be a needless dick. The council can kiss my ass. There's also parts of the dialogue starts shifting around. Ooh. It's kind of like a heavy rain from 13 years ago. A game that aged about as well as an open bottle of milk. A lot of this ends up being style over substance more 
than anything. It's more of a novelty than an actual good mechanic. But by far the worst piece of gameplay in this thing is the rhythm games. Holy shit, these are bad. These are some of the worst rhythm games I have ever seen in anything ever. So you get these three dots down here and you press a button to, you know, hit the dots in the dot. And you also get these controller prompts up here, A, B, X, and Y, you know, the traditional thing. And there are also stick prompts too that you pull down on. So overall, pretty straightforward, right? Here's the issue. These are very poorly designed. For one thing, the background video and all the stuff happening up here gets really disorienting. They'll show like flashbacks and shit and it'll like distract you from the actual rhythm game that's happening right now. Wow, incredible. They learn lessons from the Guitar Hero Live School of how not to make a rhythm game. But get this, somehow these sections are still way too easy. So you would think that these, you know, bottom holes here represent a certain button on the controller, right? Like X, Y, and whatnot. Well, get this, they don't. Meaning you can press any button for any one of these and get it right. Not only that, but there is no penalty for open notes. Meaning you can just spam the X button and move the control stick around and just win the game. With no attention to the actual rhythm of the song at all. It's a rhythm game where you don't have to follow the rhythm of the song. Because of this, I got over 90% on all of my performances on my first playthrough. A Night in the Woods did this way better. In that game, there are also rhythm game segments. But for one thing, if you play an open note, you actually get fucking penalized for it. And the background side visuals aren't completely distracting either. Meaning you can focus on the rhythm game segments of the rhythm game segments. Oh, here's another really annoying thing. There are eight chapters in this game, right? Except the only indicators that tell you what chapter you're actually on are the Steam achievements. Meaning there's no in-game indicator separating chapter from chapter. So in other words, uh, fuck you if you want a goddamn break from this game. A lot of this stuff is pretty simple stuff, so I have no clue how they fucked it up. It's just a lot of completely baffling decisions all around. It's insane to me that they fucked up the gameplay in a game where gameplay isn't meant to be the focus. God damn it, I've been here for like 15 minutes and haven't even talked about the goddamn story yet. Number three, the characters all suck. In a character-driven game with multiple choices and multiple character interactions, there is of course nothing more important than crafting good characters. Sadly, good by Volcano High is uh, not one of those huh? games. A damn shame as that's kind of a requirement for the genre. Now, of course, a long, long time ago, back in the elder years, I criticized Life is Strange, the video game, for having downright awful characters. In that game, I hated pretty much every single person and wanted them to die. It's kind of like you are the am supercomputer and I have no mouth and I must scream. This abstract, almost Lovecraftian, yet man-made abomination that hates humanity with every fiber of its being. A sentient creature who loathes humanity for giving him the curse of existence. And he's forced to watch as the slaves he keeps alive give in to their own depravities. Much like the main character's final punishment, Am has no mouth and must scream. The difference is, Am was already there at the start. That's what Life is Strange's characters were kinda like. I bring all this up because very clearly Goodbye Volcano High is in some way influenced by Life is Strange. And it seems like in that regard, it also paid some attention to the criticism towards it. The characters aren't nearly as vitriolic. Which on paper is good until you realize that characters are completely boring. Even the characters that are meant to be quirky and come off as annoying at first end up just being sterile by the end. Now instead of hating every character, I just kinda feel, eh. For every character. Which, believe it or not, in this case is actually significantly worse than Life is Strange. Because in this case, I'm forgetting like most of the characters' names. And you know what they say, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. That's the thing, you need a balance because that's where your point comes from. But in Goodbye Volcano High, there is no balance. They tried to make every character likable, but ended up driving in the complete opposite direction on the goddamn road. Anyways, let's actually get into these stupid ass characters. First off, there's the star of the show. The main character of Fang, they're so obviously influenced by Chloe Price. They're all that have the epic attitude and whatnot. Even the main actor, Latch, La 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 queer actor Lachlan Watson. Lachlan Watson, there we go. That's very convenient. Even the main actor, Lachlan Watson, sounds like they're doing their best Ashley Birch impression. Ooh, watch out, class president. Don't want to be caught throwing words like anarchy around. I'd dose those candy flipping morons and watch them twitch into a DJ dance death rattle. 
Ooh. Take a photo of that. Also, like Chloe Price, they get very upset when their friends don't hang out with them. So literally, exactly like Chloe Price. But again, the game is way too afraid of making Fang too unlikable. So they portray it as this really sad, emotional, relatable fear. And it's so hilariously out of nowhere every time. I'm not sure if it's just how I played the game or not, but it felt so abrupt when drama started happening. Because every time things start bubbling up, it's brushed past so fast. This makes any actual flaws Fang does have pretty contrived. And are usually resolved like in the exact same scene like five minutes later. But by the way, uh, this is the best character in the game. A boneless Chloe Price. I'm gonna sing Night in the Woods as praises again because that has two characters that does this better. What's funny in that game is that Mae Borowski, the main character, is actually unlikable. And she comes in and ruins the lives of a lot of characters in this game. But she never intends to. And the game very brilliantly humanizes her. And furthermore, it also deconstructs Mae and allows for a really smart exploration on mental illness. The other character is B, the goth crocodile. She's a goth who's also mad at her best friend, but this time, again, no spoilers, uh, she kinda has a pretty good reason to be. And this leads into one of the most beautifully bittersweet subplots in a game that I've ever seen. Of course, no character in any of these games comes even close to Destroy Lonely and Look Killer. I work on something to get some ass in my ditch. I guess. Anyways, the next character is Trish, who's meant to be the funny, quirky best friend, except she's not very funny. The attempts at quirk come off as force, and the chemistry between her and Fang is pretty unnatural. They're feeling more like a Saturday morning cartoon kind of best friendship. All with secret handshakes and all that, but rarely any actual connection. They're best friends by proxy, and that's about it. Again, this makes Trish a character who is pretty boring, all things considered. She's there to make the plot contrivances happen, and not be an actual good character on her own. Next, you have Fang's other friend, Reed. He's a very chill dude and loves playing not D&D. Now, get this. Again, this character is completely boring because he doesn't fucking do anything. And you are also here. Yep. <laughs> You have Nazer, Fang's older brother, who is the class president, and who you would think would be more traditional than Fang, and might lead to different ideologies between them, but again, it never really does at all. In other words, he doesn't do anything. There's also Rosa, a character I completely forgot existed until I recorded this line for her. There's also Sage and Stella, two besties. These two up the quirk factor to a million. At first, I thought I would hate these characters because I found them kind of annoying, but then they ended up uh, not doing anything. Is there a disease for this? Although I Ironically, Sage has the one interaction that I actually liked in the game. So Sage is trans and Fang is non-binary, right? And the two of them have one, one conversation about how they have trouble feeling accepted. And it's the one conversation I like in this game because there is something, one thing, where the characters actually bond over something. Oh wait, it's over now and not expanded upon again? Oh wowie. I'm gonna fucking off myself in front of the goddamn writers of this thing. And finally, there's Naomi. This character character is the yearbook committee's nerd emoji, and like Nazer, is very annoyingly diplomatic. However, this time she's the out-of-nowhere love interest, and one of the most awkwardly handled romances uh, ever. Gotta say, the one slightly deep conversation really made me laugh out loud. It becomes even funnier when there's a mysterious text message Fang receives, and they don't think it's a scam or creepy or anything and start dumping their personal information into it. And then turns out it's Naomi the whole time, and the two become romantically involved. Shit just happens in this game, dude. These two characters barely show any respect for each other beforehand, so when the romance actually happens, it's so just out of nowhere. I think I'm still stunned they even went with this route. This is terrible. How do you make a character-driven high school game with a bunch of different colorful characters and forget to develop all of them? Life is Strange did this better. At least the characters goddamn did something. Good Goodbye Volcano High doesn't even try. It gives you the bare minimum minimum of the bare minimum of the bare minimum. These are some of the most boring, unrefined characters I've seen in a minute. And sadly, those characters exist in the god-awful Part game. 4. The story <laughs> sucks ass. I'm gonna keep this simple. There is one glaring issue with the story. And that's, um, Holy nothing Christ. happens? This game took me roughly around six hours to beat, right? And I kid you not, for the first four of those, the game is pretty much dicking around about nothing. <laughs> nothing happens in the first four hours of of this 
this thing. So again, you play as Fang. They're a high school student and they have a band. And they want to play at Lollapalooza with Playboy Cardi. But there's also a giant meteor heading for the dinosaurs. Which is brought up an hour into the game and not looked at again until the last, like, hour. Instead, you get a lot more time spent with characters talking about nothing with each other. It's like an endurance test for how much a pointless shit can go on in a game. I'm not even joking. It's really hard describing what goes on the first four hours because nothing really does. It's established early on that Trish is big into bugs and wants to become a bug scientist. And this makes Fang worry that she'll leave the band and not be their bestest friend anymore. This is established through random internal monologues like a fucking Terrence Malick movie. You never feel the full brunt of them feeling like they're losing their best friend. And furthermore, Trish joins the band anyways in the end, so fuck it, Lamau. The writers really went to fuck it, we ball with this shit. Who cares? It's like everything in the story is made to waste your time. I don't think we're on the same page about Caldera. You never asked what we wanted. There's only so much time we have left. I can't spend the rest of it following along after you. I've been doing whatever I want and ignoring what you want and we don't have to love the same things. We still love each other. Did I rope you all into this? Did I make it all about me? My show? Our show. <laughs> You also have these completely just awful Dungeons and Dragons sessions where Fang joins their friend's D&D &D group. And at first I'm like, wow, this is kind of cute. And then these sections went on for like 10 million goddamn years. I'ma just say it, these sections are fucking awful. They're so boring. I started just skipping through them because they were so goddamn monotonous. Is there like a character development in these? Why not just do that in the actual fucking game, you morons? They then try tying this in with the asteroid that's killing everyone and it's like so fucking funny. Was there like no one on the team that just said no, this might be a fucking dumb idea? I don't care about the shitty fake D&D &D campaign your story. I care about the actual fucking story. It's like the story doesn't even want to tell itself. Like it's ashamed of its actual narrative, which it should be by the way. You're a fucking ugly bitch. The game is just so focused on disconnecting you from the narrative in the first four hours. So it's really funny when in like the last hour, at the last minute, everything starts happening at once. The characters start having conflicts that end in the very next like second. The characters have finally come to terms that an asteroid is going to kill them all and start worrying about it. The game starts rushing to wrap up all the character interactions that happen so far. Which is what happens when the rest of your story is a narrative slog. Overall, the story is so incredibly boring. It's terrible. Oh, also there are dead memes in the game. Uh, fuck you. But worst of all is the ending. Oh my god. So a long, long time ago, I criticized Life is Strange for being a choice-driven game where your choices don't actually matter at all. And in actuality, there were two endings dictated by one choice at the last minute of the game. Now, to be fair, Goodbye Volcano High does something very unique by outdoing Life is Strange in this regard. So of course, the game opens with this, your choices will matter warning screen. However, unlike Life is Strange, which had a similar warning screen, but only two endings, which means that everything you've done up to that point is completely null. Goodbye Volcano High makes itself very unique by having one ending. <laughs> And on top of that, the game ends with the characters dying. I'm not joking at all, by the way. So the game ends with all the characters panicking about the asteroid. Planes begin shutting down and everybody gets super fucking worried. Of course, this isn't until like the last 30 minutes of this six hour game, which means that Rolling Loud is canceled and Fane can't perform their Dom Corleo oh, type rap beats. However, the band ends up performing their own concert themselves and everybody shows up and now the asteroid isn't taken seriously anymore. Fang, for luck. I bestow upon you my most treasured, my most lucky, my most plastic gazpacho. Or vibration. Or vibration. <laughs> I would kill myself tonight. So the characters play one last shitty rhythm game and the asteroid presumably hits them. And that's where the game ends. Everything you've done up to that point, every character you've connected with, even though you really can't because the writing's dog shit, it's just all gone. This warning screen was a scare tactic meant to make you think the game is more choice driven than it actually is. It's as if the game is raising its middle finger and saying fuck you to everyone who waited 
played and bought this game. I wasn't even excited for this game, and even I'm pissed off. Nothing matters whatsoever in this game. So, in other words, this game is a complete waste of fucking time. What a disaster. It's a frustrating, too, because there are some really decent themes in this game, on paper at least. Having a story where a bunch of high school students who have big aspirations are confronted with the reality that they're going to die, and soon. You could easily do kind of a modern version of one of my favorite movies, The Seventh Seal. I, I know, weird fucking choice. That movie's about a crusader playing chess with death during the Black Plague. The film treats the inevitability of death as ominous, which it should be, and characters ask questions like, is there a god, which you would ask, and also it doesn't waste your time. Goodbye Volcano High fumbles this execution spectacularly, in a way that isn't intelligent or smart whatsoever. Even Night in the Woods, hell, especially Night in the Woods, that game had the ominous threat of adulthood and death looming over it, and that game made sure to not waste oh your time. It feels like they rushed this very real concept of dying in the last 30 minutes of this entire thing like a high school project due at midnight. Do characters just not question any actual existential questions, like is there a god or anything? And before someone tells me that's too serious for the furry dino game, uh, they say fuck in it. Oh, fuck off, Naomi. Wait, is the asteroid just symbolism for ah. growing up? Well, if that's the case, that's a pretty bad fucking example. Also, uh, oh, Night in the Woods did it better. Boy. Because first of all, that game didn't lie to you about the ending. The game never opens with the whole your choices matter thing. Instead, opening with gasp, actual world building that immerses you into the story and world of the characters. But for another thing, the ending fits so well with this game. Despite only having two endings that don't really differ that much from each other. But yet, ironically, despite having not a whole lot of variation in the ending, the story and tone actually does change depending on who you hang out with. They change the fundamental narrative. You have to kind of play the game twice to get the full experience. And furthermore, the themes of growing up are tackled so beautifully here. Meanwhile, in Goodbye Volcano High, it's a bittersweet ending for a bittersweet ending's sake. It's good enough for games journalists, but not for me, a person with a working, functioning brain. What I'm saying is, if you want to play a high school game, where teenagers tackle the idea of death. A game with actually fun characters and decent writing, uh, a Persona 3 comes out in like five months. This is the conclusion of this the video. Is the this is the conclusion of the video. Of the this video. Is the Goodbye Volcano High is a disaster. It's kind of funny seeing how derivative this whole thing is, but yet it clearly learned the wrong lessons from its contemporaries. And because of that, there are so many alternatives out there. And at the same time, this game is so dog shit in its own right that it makes games like Life is Strange look good in comparison. It makes you ask, what's the point of this existing? It doesn't really do anything unique or fresh with the genre, and it never holds your attention ever in the game. It feels like a fan fiction for a source material that doesn't exist. From ideas that are not nearly as smart as the game thinks it is, to large portions of nothing happening that aren't nearly as interesting as the game thinks it is, to characters that aren't nearly as fun or enjoyable as the game thinks they are, it's just so goddamn boring. It is a slog to go through. It really does a feel like a high schooler's creative writing assignment. This is not a good game whatsoever. Don't waste your time with it. Okay, that's it. Bye-bye. Um, the rough draft is still coming together. Sounds like my wife. <laughs>
Life is Strange in True Colors is the latest game in the Dear God Just Play Night in the Woods instead genre. You see, I made this joke in the last video I made, so you know where this is going. This is the third and final game in the Life is Strange series. At least until the next one comes out, inevitably. So first, a quick history of the Life is Strange series so far. You have the first game, developed by Don't Nod, and a game that I think is overrated dog shit. A game full of awful contrivances and the worst dialogue ever. At least at the time. I think Clone High got it beat. It was then followed up by Life is Strange Before the Storm, a game starring the worst video game character ever made, Chloe Price. That game was made by Deck Nine and was somehow kinda even more dog shit. Even if you liked Chloe Price, the prequel adds nothing to her character and is, at its very best, more of the same shit content. Don't Nod then came back for Life is Strange 2, a game that is actually almost pretty good. That is, until it nosedives after <laughs> Chapter 2, with side plots that go nowhere and pretty pretty mishandled politics. Will turns out after this don't not have fucked off to make their own shit, including a game called Tell Me Why, which I got for free one month. Maybe one day I'll talk about it, who knows? However, with Don't Not Now fucked off, it's now time for the Before the Storm guys, Deck 9, to return and give Square Enix that easy Life is Strange money. Oh, also around this time they released the Life is Strange remasters, which, uh, uh, yeah. Like I said, easy money. But can the same be said of True Colors, or is it actually good? So let's uh, talk Talk about it, I guess. And let's start with my thoughts. Drum roll, please. My thoughts on True Colors are it's actually really boring. I think overall it's kinda better than the first game. It's not egregiously awful. The best way I can describe it is like if Goodbye Volcano High tried to actually be good and it tried ripping off Night in the Woods. But of course, because it's also a Life is Strange game, it's also written not very well. A lot of my points for this game are very similar to the ones I made for Goodbye Volcano High. And thankfully, though they're not nearly as bad. However, sadly, they're still uh, in the game. So first off, what's this game about? Well, it's about Alex Chen, a girl who moves to Colorado to reunite with her brother Gabe. However, Gabe then dies. So when convenient, the game turns into Day's sex, and Alex and her friends have to take down Typhon, a giant mining company. Also, Alex has emotion powers, where she can read and even control people's emotions when the plot calls for it. It really only happens at convenient times, and it's also just really lame. We go from time travel to telekinesis to fucking emotion power. You play as an empath. Wow, riveting. It feels like they put in this power because it's a Life is Strange game and they had to, rather than actually wanting to include a power. You could tell almost the exact same story without the power and it wouldn't be a whole lot different. I will say though, it is a very pretty looking game. They seem to have finally nailed the gap between art style and visual fidelity. So this is the first Life is Strange game where faces actually move like faces. Faces scrunch up and ring the characters emote and look sad and happy and whatnot. And the environments look really nice too. You can tell Square Enix gave them a nice bigger budget for this one. There are some parts that are made to just, you know, flex the graphical fidelity. And you're like, okay, bro, it's not that serious, my man. But sadly, the game is still extremely boring. It has a very similar pacing problem to Goodbye Volcano High, where big eventful plot points take forever to get to, with a lot of time being spent meandering around. While ironically, actually interesting plot events are way too short short and end up just feeling really rushed overall. And thankfully, here's the good news, it's not nearly as bad as Goodbye Volcano High. The slower scenes do allow for some world building. Unlike Goodbye Volcano High, I feel like there is a world outside of my peripheral friend group, but again, the game still lacks that forward moving momentum. A lot of time is spent just dicking around and walking around. It still hasn't learned that night in the woods balance of being both a cozy yet a forward moving. As a result, the story is both meandering and rushed at the same time. It's too boring boring to really get invested into anything, and yet, if you somehow do get invested, it's over with a goddamn whimper. Oh, and of course, what's a shitty indie adventure game without a shitty fake RPG segment? That's by the way, lasts way too long. At least this one only lasts one scene, though. It has a really crazy final boss ending. Take that, goodbye, Volcano High. Suck my cock. However, I will admit, it is refreshing playing as a young adult this time. There are too many games in this kind of pseudo-genre where I play as a fucking high schooler. Either that or some disgruntled middle-aged man. We don't get too many games about young adults. We have a True Colors and uh, Night in the Woods. At this point, man, I'll take what I can get. This game also feels like it rips off the structure of Life is Strange. You're a relatively shy main character. There's a love interest girl who's into music. There's a male love interest you can also fuck. Most of the last chapter is a shitty dream sequence. Is that what I look like? Really? 
you have a plot twist where an older character is revealed to be the bad guy. Now, here's the good news. Overall, I found a lot of this stuff to be better than the original game. For one thing, the plot twist with the character of Jed in this game actually caught me off guard a little bit. It's not the greatest plot twist or anything, but they kind of build him up as a semi-father figure. So when he tries to kill Alex and it's revealed that he killed her father, all of it during a mining accident, which he's hiding because he's guilty over it, it kind of made me go, oh shit, they were kind of subtle about this. Why are you sad? <laughs> Why did I jump? 12 years ago. Did anybody else jump? However, first of all, it's the exact same thing they did with Mr. Jefferson. Only he's no longer the fucking Joker. And secondly, the twist itself feels very rushed. Because right after this, all that really happens is Alex uses her powers to make him cry. <laughs> Jed Lucan isn't a hero. That whole story is a lie. And when I found out, as you can see, he tried to kill me too. These accusations are... Well, they're insane. My brother in Christ, she's bleeding. Press some goddamn charges. And then fade to black, and now the radio says he's arrested. And that's uh, where the game ends. <laughs> Come on, that's so anticlimactic. That's so lame. Give me that chip. Fuck you. <laughs> Anyways, for another thing, I think the side characters on paper are better. Steph is way less of a dickhead than Chloe Price. And Ryan is way less creepy than Warren. That's good. However, the characters have one fundamental problem. They're boring. Again, it's almost a good Bible Kano High problem. Where Life is Strange, the original had vehemently unlikable characters. Now in this game, they're trying to correct that, but then they overcorrect. And what you get are characters that the writers really want you to like, but aren't developed at all, and are just kind of boring personality-wise. There is a bit more going on with them, thankfully. They do communicate, at least. Characters do share grief over the death of Alex's brother, Gabe. They express hopes and dreams and whatnot. There's more going on with them, but it's still not enough for me to really care about these characters. Cool. Yeah. And again, back to my main point, the overall plot is the same as the first game, roughly. So as a result, you get a pretty derivative experience with a bunch of forgettable stuff in it. And thankfully, it's not a good by Volcano High and it isn't egregious with it. But True Colors is, at its heart, underwhelming. Severely underwhelming. It's a pretty unsatisfying, unremarkable experience. It's impossible to hate, but also impossible to truly love. As a result, talking about this game and making this video is actually way harder than I thought. Like, what more is there to say that I haven't already said? And what is there to say, period? There's nothing really eventful or outstanding in this game. The dialogue is whatever. There's a couple of cringy lines here and there, but overall, I didn't want to hang myself, which for this game is a massive step up. This is probably the best dialogue in a Life is Strange game, which of course, by these game standards, means slightly above tolerable. I think Gabe's gotten so emo that he doesn't like instruments anymore. Like I said, slightly above tolerable. Oh yeah, there's also the main character herself, Alex Chen, a character who makes great strides in the Life is Strange game franchise. Normally these games are very hard to sit through, but in true colors, the main character made me hard instead. I found her very attractive, and yes, I would have sex with her. And you can really only get that kind of analysis from this YouTube channel, uh, subscribe by the way. And of course, I am an ally of the queer community, and as such, I found it my duty to give you guys the lesbian root in this game because we we are we, we are pro di diverse di di sadly outside of that she's a pretty boring character it's implied she has emotional issues however she doesn't actually have them in the story at all there is literally like one instance where it happens and that's it she was seeing a therapist at one point but she has no actual like mental illnesses or flaws or anything and for a large part of the rest of the story it goes unexplored blah 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 night in the woods bit it Better, you get the idea. So outside of being a player in search, she's not really that investing. Which is weird because they build up her past as being some kind of mystery. But she really isn't that mysterious of a character. And furthermore, the plot is that she was an orphan her whole life. So by the end, I'm staring at the game going, what's the point? Why did you build this up? It didn't need to be built up. In fact, I might have connected to Alex easier if the game just told me she was an orphan from the beginning. So then I know her whole motives and backstory firsthand. There's a reason why, for example, in The Last of Us, us, the first thing you see is Sarah dying. Because that, in turn, drives the narrative forward. It haunts the whole game. And I wish True Colors did that too. I guess the game also tries tackling loss overall in the game, especially with how open-ended the ending kind of is, with Gabe's ghost being there or whatever. But again,
again, the game sets it up wrong. I'm not given much of a reason to care about these people at all, aside from their siblings. Again, I would have done something like The Last of Us or Firewatch, where you know from the get-go why the characters are the way they are. It would have led to a more personal, intimate story, you know? Oh, that reminds me, uh, the ending. Sadly, this is yet another choice-driven game where the ending sucks. But basically, the endings are, do you stay or leave your little town that you've been spending the entire game in with whoever the fuck you decided to romance in the game? Which, by the way, you don't actually see the results. You just kind of talk to your dead brother, imagine one of the results, and then choose which one you want. Your overall choices don't actually really matter in the game at all. And that's so disappointing, dude. After Life is Strange 2, which was actually an improvement, not perfect, but better, it really sucks that True Colors is a downgrade. An underwhelming downgrade that just kind of ends. I think I'm getting real tired of games that claim to have these multiple choices that matter, but they end up just being completely fake illusions. Look, I get that it's hard to make these kinds of games and have that kind of forethought, but I don't think it's too much to ask for the game to not lie to me. Why do we even have these Your Choices Matter screens anymore? They pretty much just set the game up to fail. Is this the Life is Strange staple or something? Text on a black screen that really only exists to give you the first playthrough illusion and ruin any other subsequent playthrough? I guess I do kind of appreciate how the game is more open-ended, tying in with the theme of grieving over your dead brother. But again, the whole final part of the game is so rushed overall. It kind of just has you sitting there going, that's it. It's less satisfying or artsy or cathartic or anything. And kind of just more, eh, whatever. And that's how I can best describe this game. It's, eh, whatever. It's not awful or terrible, but I wouldn't even call it good or even okay. It's just mediocre. I found the game to be very boring overall. With massive pacing problems that make the game both slow paced and rushed. A story that feels overall largely the same as anything else. And characters that just don't stick out to me at all. The one interesting part is the DMCA music option in the game, where you can mute the licensed music for, you know, streaming the game. They didn't replace the music at all, so you just get these awkward silent scenes just out of nowhere. Aw, oh, yes, nothing like ruining the experience for people that want to stream the game in front of an audience, who really don't want to risk their revenue being taken away by playing a copyrighted song on Twitch.tv. What else happened? Uh, my game crashed once. That's interesting. There's also one other part where Alex sings Creep by Radiohead, and that made me laugh. And that's kind of about it. I genuinely wish I had more to say in this video, but I really don't. It's just kind of boring, but not in like an offensive way like Goodbye Volcano High was. It's not terrible, but it really isn't interesting. Apparently not even Life is Strange fans really enjoy this one. It's just kind of mediocre. And nothing short of very boring. I'm not even kidding here. If I had anything else to say, this video would be way longer. This game is like a light five at absolute best. And will fade from my memory by the time this video goes up. Oh well, better than Goodbye Volcano High at least. At least I got to jack off to the main character. Fuck you in the lane you came with. Me and you ain't on the same shit. You ain't in my lane, bitch. Nah, throw that shit in fifth. Rolly on my wrist. Ay, baby, you a son. I'm my only wish. I'm counting. Blue honest. I'm too money. Ay, I'm a little bitch. You too lovely. Yeah, hanging up and calling me right back. Ay, why you calling me like that? Yeah. Getting high with the seat, lay back. Baby, gon' relax, yeah. Hey, they don't know the half, yeah. No matter what happened, I got your back. Baby, that's the facts, yeah. That's the facts, yeah. Hey, yeah we can fight, but the feeling's gone. I try to find the words, but they never come. I can still see you on the lawn. Hey, laying outside in the summer sun. Yeah, we can fight, but the feeling's gone. But they never come I can still see you on the lawn hey, Laying outside in the summer sun hey, I'm with a dark skin girl on a Sunday That's that black Sabbath She put them ones all down on a Hyundai And she had a habit Baby, that's the facts, yeah That's the facts, yeah Bro, why is it always a fucking problem when I'm ordering this fucking order, bro. This specific fucking order that I be ordering, Caramel McFlurry, Caramel with the Oreos. That's what I be ordering. I always have a fucking problem with this shit. I'm sitting there asking this woman, the manager, hey, look, I want two Caramel McFlurries with Oreos. Put Caramel at the bottom and Caramel on side the uh, cup. Fucking give me an extra cup of Caramel and give me a cup of Oreos. I will pay extra for it. She talking about that's against guidelines. We can't do that.
Like, bitch, I just did it the other day. What are you talking about? Bro, and then I'm trying to be nice as fuck to the bitch. I'm like, hey, before I said I want the cup of caramel shit, I said, hey, did you make the caramel McFlurry? She said, yeah, I said, thank you. Like, thank you for doing it right, because I'm always having problems with this. Then I'm thinking we we good. She come back to the window and I say, hey, I'm missing my cup of caramel and a cup of Oreos. She talking about, oh, we can't do that. We'll get charged for doing that. Like, bitch, you gonna go to jail for fucking giving me a cup of caramel? Like, what are you talking about, man?